Good morning, everyone. Um, it looks like folks are popping in the room. 9 a.m. I hope you have your beverage of choice. Mine this morning is going to be a nice hot detox tea, um, but coffee is always a good one too, if, if that's your jam. Uh, so yeah, as folks roll in, I'm going to adjust my screen a little here. See how your face is. Morning, it looks like it's so rolling in. Okay, so as Jacob does the magical back end work here to get us situated, and I get my screen to work. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to day two of WealthWorks. Um, for those who were with us yesterday, uh, we laid the groundwork for the principles of WealthWorks, be, the, the theory behind the practice that both rural action and many practitioners, those of you in the room today, those of you working, you know, your colleagues in, in the field, whether in clean energy, whether in community development, um, these are some of the practices that your colleagues are using and I hope you use. Um, we, we really, as I wanna thank you from Rural Action um, for coming here today and um, uh, taking the time to understand the way our work can weave together. Um, I am gonna be your MC today. Uh, my name is Sarah Conley Ballou and I'm Rural Action Sustainable Energy Solutions Director. Uh, in that role, uh, since 2018, um, we've done a kind of deep dive into what is needed here in rural Appalachian, Ohio, but really extending even beyond to the foothills of Kentucky, PA, West Virginia, and other places to understand, know, and respond actively, proactively, to our community's needs when it comes to a brighter and cleaner energy future. Um, that work embeds well in Rural Action's broader mission, which Brian, who is here, will share more about soon. Um, but that work really aligns with our core values as an organization and as a community to really root the work that we do with the place that we love, the people that we that matter to us. And so that, that's how we align our work. Um, our clean energy focus falls into kind of three buckets, re renewable energy development being an important step for people to take here, but we need that to be affordable, accessible, and uh, right-sized for the community of need. Our work around that includes making, well, we do, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get into the details <laughs> there. Um, our work around uh, sustainable uh, energy, thinking about sort of the efficiency side, um, conservation of energy is, is such a critical first step. Um, the Clean Energy Pledge is one step that some businesses and institutions have taken in our region to reduce their energy use over time. Uh, so they use the Clean Energy Pledge and the tools that it, and resources that it has to you know, create a, um, a, a good foundation for energy savings. The third category is around sustainable uh, transportation and clean transportation. Uh, we know that we're in a big transition as a nation, certainly as a state, and clean transportation is a critical infrastructure need that we have to build for. Five years from now, the world of transportation will look very different. 
and we know that and we all can kind of agree to that fact. Now, how do we prepare? How do we get our communities that have different needs and uh, different wants um, to really be ready? The Roadmap Project is our flagship with that. Uh, several of you are part of that Roadmap Project in one way or another, um, but adoption of electric vehicles is such a critical step too. Um, it is long, deep and hard work that takes time. So again, I thank everyone who's here today who is part of that journey, whether with rural action or on your own, um, really, really value you. I value your time. I value the work that you do. So thank you again for being here. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Brian Vatican, uh, Rural Action's Chief Program Officer and truly, my uh, knight in shining armor on so many things. Uh, he's, a, he's a great one to know. Okay, go ahead, Brian. Thanks, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, I will uh, make sure to keep us on time here and just, uh, just speak briefly, but the main objective that I wanted to accomplish, I think many of you are familiar with Rural Action. We're you know, beyond sustainable energy. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization um, based in Appalachian, Ohio trying to serve, uh, aspiring to serve the 32 counties of Appalachian, Ohio. We've got offices here in Athens County, um, in Morgan County, and in Tuscaroras County. <clears throat> so we're really trying to um, <clears throat> develop programming and you know, uh, outreach and community development that fits in all of those different areas, which as we all know, like Eastern Central Ohio, the energy landscape, um, both traditional and what's to come is significantly different from uh, here in Athens County. So it's, it's exciting to work across all those areas. But uh, we are here in the Buckeye Hills region. And that was what I, what I wanted to say before we get uh, started here today was a thank you and an acknowledgement to the Buckeye Hills Regional Council staff um, who really got this project started. Um, so, uh, gosh, a year and a half ago, two years ago now, uh, we were speaking with several staff members at Buckeye Hills who, in, you know, getting EDA funding and, and really trying to figure out our resilience plan for a region, wanted us to think about, well, what are the, what are the sectors that we can focus on to, to make our economy here in the Buckeye Hills region more resilient? Um, and I definitely believe that the, the clean energy and sort of the associated fields is one of those. Um, I think that really one of our aspirations in bringing everyone here together is to think about how the Buckeye Hills region um, benefits from this transition, right? How like our preparation, as Sarah said, uh, really leads to more workforce development programs, more small businesses, more larger businesses, uh, more energy, clean energy produced here in Southeast Ohio. Um, we, uh, at Rural Action, starting sort of in our zero waste program, but we've tried to adopt it uh, across many of our programs. We have a, a framework we call waste to wealth. Uh, and it's really an extension of that asset-based community development framework that we spoke about yesterday, where we're looking at things that, you know, like abandoned coal mines, abandoned mine lands, um, landfills and uh, dump sites and things that historically here we've looked at as uh, deficits and as, as waste and trash. Um, and how can we work together uh, as a region to find ways to capture economic value out of that? I think, you know, as Dale mentioned yesterday, there's certainly some questions about it, but, you know, we see that now with the questions about remining old gob piles for rare earth minerals. Um, Again, a lot more investigation to be done there, but that's the framework. You know, there's there's many ways to go about this question of, you know, taking what traditionally has been seen as um, sometimes as a sacrifice zone uh, for materials, for trash from the East Coast, for um, you know the producing the nation's energy, and turning that into a region that can really benefit uh, and create rooted wealth here from the clean energy transition. So all that to say. Um, we're really grateful for the support of Buckeye Hills Regional Council because I think that working with you all lends, um, you know, credibility and support to this economic sector. Uh, I think 
the the way people see this now versus the way they saw it even five years ago has evolved significantly in our region. Um, and I appreciate uh, your forward looking uh, approach there. I, um, Sarah, would you like to tee up the first session? I would love to, okay. yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for having yeah, me. so as, as you see in the agenda here today, we're just doing a deep dive into a lot of different resources. Just know now you're going to have a million questions after each one because there's a lot here. So um, that's okay. Write down your questions, put them in the chat. Um, and also know that each one of the people that you hear from today would love to hear from you later. So we'll make sure you get their email address if you have questions as a follow-up, by all means reach out to them. So yeah, with that said, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, this is Joe Clarida. Uh, Joe is the Executive Director of Power of Clean Future Ohio. Let me switch screens here and read from this one. Um, yeah, so Power A Clean Future Ohio is a diverse coalition of organizations that work with cities and municipalities in Ohio to develop community-driven carbon reduction strategies. Power A Clean Future Ohio empowers local governments and community members by providing tools and resources to implement climate actions that are achievable, measurable, equitable, and economical. And I'm sure that's just scratching the surface it's my turn to turn it over to Joe. Joe, thank you for being here. And it's all you. Let me unshare here. There you go. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Sarah. And thanks to the whole team at Rural Action for the invitation to be here today and speak to you about uh, a really exciting issue and a uh, topic that is really central for what PCFO is doing. So I will go ahead and share my screen. So just give me one second. Uh, and I promise I will try and keep this uh, quick and punchy, and hopefully you'll uh, get a lot out of it over the next 15 minutes. Uh, we'll get uh, through quite a bit of content, I hope. Um, but I wanted to talk to you today about uh, what we launched two years ago, and I'll get into some of the details, but then really dig into what it looks like for a local government, for a community to build a clean energy toolkit. What does it look like for them to put a plan together and implement some of these resources that we have available for cities? Um, now, there's a lot of different ways to approach this work. I'll say that from the outset. We're going to hear from some really great speakers following me that can dig into uh, deeper on some of these uh, policy areas. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. This is one model and, and one set of resources that I hope uh, if, if you're representing a local government or you want your local government involved, that you'll take a, a closer look at. So um, Sarah so eloquently introduced us and, and touched a little bit on our mission statement, which you can read there. And I encourage you, if you want to learn more about anything that I'm talking about, uh, visit our website, powercleanfuture.org, uh, and you can you can take a look at all the different things we have uh, ongoing. So with that, I'll go ahead and dive in. Um, so as we know, local governments, um, you know, have got a lot on their plate. There's a lot that they have to take in. Uh, you know, they have to address in the community, whether it's, you know, managing roads and public safety, um, making sure that residents are uh, getting access to the resources that they need and the public services they need, um, certainly working with their local school districts and doing all the, there's all kinds of things under, on their uh, plate uh, that they have to take care of. So we know naturally what happens is uh, something has to fall by the wayside. And what we've observed is oftentimes that's sustainability. Some of these issues that we care so deeply about uh, don't rise to the same level of prioritization. And so that's something that we wanted to address. So we launched this initiative in February of 2020 to help provide local governments uh, with the resources and tools they need to be a catalyst for them to act on these issues. Um, and really approaching at it from a variety of different angles, which I'll speak a little bit uh, about here in a second, but uh, really focusing on just local governments. There's no other, no other work uh, that PCFO does besides focusing with uh, cities and counties, municipalities, um, to help them with the, with the tools they need, the resources, resources they need, and address some of the, the uh, issues that have come up with local governments. Number one, there's a, there's a technical capacity issue. Um, obviously, local governments is a big umbrella term. It represents you know, cities as large as uh, Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland, and down to the small villages um, and townships all across the state. Um, but we do know for a lot of those cities, you know, they don't have a sustainability director. They don't have staff waiting to do this work. Um, and so there's sometimes a technical capacity 
uh, issue when it comes to trying to pursue a renewable energy project or purchase an electric vehicle. So how do we how do we bridge that gap? How do we make sure that they have the resources they need? Um, there's also an issue of, of just general staff capacity, right? Where every, everyone seems stretched thin these days. Uh, certainly that is the case for local government staff as well. Um, and of course, funding is always an issue. I will say when we launched this, we didn't have nearly the same level of federal funding that we're seeing today. Um, but with that come some opportunities to help advise cities on how to spend some of those federal dollars that we're seeing come down uh, to local governments as well. So that's how we've structured this is to, to address some of those gaps. And we've done it in a way, you know, since I mentioned uh, funding is an issue, always an issue. Um, we've made this a free program. So it's free for governments to participate in. Um, they do not have to, uh, you know, pay a membership due. They don't have to pay for any of the tools and resources we provide. Uh, what they simply have to do is pass a resolution or have their mayor declare their PCFO community, appoint someone to be our point of contact for us to work directly with, and fill out an intake survey. It's relatively simple and straightforward. Those, those steps get you in the door, and then from there we help uh, figure out what you want to do and, and how we can work with you. So just briefly on, on some of our goals and how we work. Um, you know, one thing that is, I think, really exciting in this moment for clean energy, clean transportation solutions, is that the finances around them are starting to come to a place where you can save money and do this work. Uh, some of these decisions that governments are making, uh, you know, some of them are for environmental reasons, and we're certainly pushing uh, governments to think about those. But oftentimes what I hear from local governments is, we just did this because it made financial sense. This, made, this was the best financial choice for us uh, to manage our budget, to manage our expenses, um, to best serve the community. So uh, one thing that we keep in mind is, is knowing that, that funding is, is always a challenge, is that the, the things that we propose to local governments, we want to make sure they're financially feasible and viable. Um, in some cases, it's an investment up front uh, that you certainly have to make the case for. Other times, it's an opportunity to save money over years um, by investing in clean energy. Um, the other really exciting part about this work is the economic growth that can come and the investment in the community. Um, there are all kinds of new jobs emerging in the clean energy economy. Uh, we also know those uh, old jobs and dirty energy uh, are oftentimes being uh, taken elsewhere or being moved or no longer available. So we have to think about for our own communities, what can we do to help stimulate economic growth? What can we do to provide stability for residents? And one of those things is let's invest in the future uh, technology that we see coming into our state and into um, the local economy. Um, and so, you know, right before the, the pandemic, just, you know, as an example, two of the fastest growing careers in the country uh, were solar installers and wind technicians. So we knew that those two jobs were growing at a rapid rate and we expect them to bounce back quickly uh, post pandemic as well. Um, but that is one way in which if you're investing in this, you're sending a market signal out to business investors to say, our community is, is ready for this, it's interested in this, our residents want it, uh, come invest in, and train our uh, local uh, residents to help work in this, uh, this industry. Um, and then, you know, one thing that brings a, a large part of our coalition together uh, is the environmental impact. We wanna make sure that we are addressing uh, the overall emissions of the state of Ohio. Ohio, depending on what you look at, how is the sixth largest uh, emitter in the state of, or in the country? Um, you know, the U.S. being the second largest emitter in the world. Uh, so the idea that we, we've got to address climate change, we have to address this issue. Uh, the only way to do that is, is for Ohio to play its part. And so uh, the solution that we see, we certainly haven't seen much action at the state level to do these, do this work. Uh, we see a, a path forward to do this at the local level. And I keep saying this over and over like a broken record, but if we can do this locally, we can do it globally. Uh, we can find solutions that fit with, within our community and address this very difficult, uh, wicked, uh, global challenge. And so uh, it's certainly what excites me and brings, brings my passion to this work. Um, and then finally, I'll just say implementing equitable clean energy policy is really critical too. If we don't build an equitable system, um, you know, it's a house of cards. We're not going to be able to sustain this in the long run. If we don't, if we further exacerbate some of the same inequalities, environmental justice issues we've seen for generations, uh, we'll never be able to solve some of these big challenges we're trying to face. So with that, over the past two years, uh, we've been able to recruit 27 communities to join uh, PCFO and do this work. And, and I, uh, what excites me about this slide here is the regional diversity, the different size and character of the communities that we um, work with. They all are doing different things and they approach this to issue from a variety of different ways. 
Um, so I mentioned before that you're, uh, you know, it, it depends on, on your community. Some communities are, are, you know, doing all of the above. Others are approaching it with, you know, one issue at a time. Uh, and obviously, as you see on this map, we have the largest cities in Ohio down to some of the smallest with a couple villages represented on here uh, with Yellow Springs uh, being one notable example in, in Southwest Ohio, um, along with the village of Silverton also down there. So uh, there's a lot of different communities that are involved in this. And what it's really great about this is that you have the opportunity to connect with others. Um, you know, as a local government, certainly they can take advice from all of our policy experts and our team and our uh, set of consultants that we help uh, connect them with. But oftentimes, you know, as you work with an elected official or a city staff member, and they will they will love to be innovative and brave, and I pr so appreciate that. Uh, but they will also ask that question of, well, has this been done before? And can you show me where there's an example uh, of someone who's done this? And what are the pitfalls that I should be thinking about? What are the things I need to, to keep in mind? Um, how has this worked in the real world when you actually put steel on the ground or you put funding behind a project? And so having this great peer-to-peer -peer network of communities to look to uh, when you're trying to do a project uh, to be able to say, hey, let me reach out to the city and get their input and advice on how, that, how it worked for them, I think is a really critical piece to this as well. So I want to just walk you quickly through, and there's a lot of words on this slide, so I'll go quickly, but um, this is the, the set of resources that we've been able to pull together over the past two years uh, for uh, cities and local governments to take advantage of. Um, and we've identified these across kind of four key policy areas, which I'll speak a little bit more about here in a minute, but uh, it's renewable energy, energy efficiency, transportation, electrification, and land use. And so across those four areas, you'll see uh, much of that uh, these tools represent within each of those four buckets. And so uh, if you're looking to put together a sustainability plan, a climate action plan, which we'll, we'll dive into here in a moment, um, we can provide you some of those consulting services, a fleet inventory, which um, hopefully you're going to hear some from Clean Fields Ohio on how that worked already, and um, you know, tree canopy assessments, understanding what your tree canopy looks like, what do residents have access to green space, certainly a really critical and direct environmental justice issue that we see uh, within our cities that represents uh, when you look at a map, uh, some of the historical inequities um, that the communities have faced. Uh, equity coaching, really to dig in on what does it look like to provide an equitable uh, you know, sustainability policy for my say, who am I engaging with? Who am I hearing from? Um, doing an audit, understanding what, what policies and programs you have already deployed and how are they impacting the community and how are they, uh, how are they directed by citizens by local residents on how to do this work as well. Uh, greenhouse gas inventories are a really critical tool to be able to actually baseline your emissions and understand, you know, if I'm going to set a goal, if I'm going to be aggressive and say, I want to reduce my emissions by 50% by 2030, how am I actually getting there? What are the things I need to be investing in? What are, where am I going to get the biggest bang for my buck? Um, and then finally, uh, you know, a couple other items I want to just flag is you know, community choice aggregation is a, I would say probably the number one tool. Um, if you wanted to talk to a community about how they can reduce their emissions, the first thing I would say is a community choice aggregation is an incredible tool that not many states in the US have, uh, and we can utilize it to help purchase renewable energy for your entire city, for your entire uh, community. And so I would say that tool is especially relevant and interesting um, for cities to think about and to incorporate into the sustainability and climate action goals. Um, and of course, energy efficiency, that's good government. And I think that's something that we, we um, like to talk to as many uh, folks about as possible. If you can do energy efficiency work, even if it's just for your government operations, it's good government to ensure that you're operating as, as efficiently and being a good steward of taxpayer dollars, but it's also a good way to address uh, some additional environmental uh, issues within your community and uh, equity issues as well. Uh, certainly those that uh, are facing higher energy burden um, have done so historically and will continue to do so unless we find a way to be creative and innovative and intervening with that uh, and provide them the right resources. Um, and doing benchmarking, helping understand uh, where you're, you're the efficiency of the buildings uh, that set up your footprint within your community and how to, how to improve that. So one exciting moment I, I talked about, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier was, was the fact that we have seen an, an historic investment uh, in local governments and in our infrastructure. Uh, so I used to work in DC and then we joke that we constantly, it would constantly be infrastructure week, right? And we've heard this joke before, every week was infrastructure week, uh, I think for all six years that I worked there. And uh, finally, uh, infrastructure week came and it actually did produce an infrastructure bill 
uh, that you see on this screen with all of the different uh, investments across a whole variety of areas that are really, really critical to the future uh, of our economy and to our environment. Um, and so I'm really excited to be able to see how local governments, cities, communities can help deploy these uh, in a way that, that you know, supports the residents and make sure that the communities are, are modernizing, but also protecting some of the public health issues that we see uh, represented in these different categories as well. And so for us, one of the things we, we asked ourselves is, well, we've got this historic investment uh, that is going to come to cities and local governments. What can we do to help continue to be a catalyst for that investment to ensure that these dollars don't just go to the same traditional uh, heavy uh, you know, carbon intensive uh, projects. Certainly those are going to get funding and, and that's just a, a fact of reality, but um, how can we make sure that, that the dollars that are going to invest in clean energy and clean transportation are well utilized and that Ohio gets as much of that funding as possible, making sure that, that our communities are aware of these, but also have the opportunity to take advantage of them. Um, so we launched uh, just last week the Infrastructure Grant Assistance Program, which you can see a little bit more about on this slide. And I encourage you once again, uh, take a look at our website if you want to learn more about this, um, powercleanfuture.org backslash IGAP, and you'll learn a little bit about uh, this program, the Infrastructure Grant Assistance Program, which talks a little bit about uh, this these issues, which is, um, you know, how do we make sure that communities, local governments are prepared and ready? And I know there's a lot of different folks working on this. And so I want to just note that right up front. You've probably gotten a ton of emails, uh, webinar invites, um, ways to educate yourself, uh, certainly working with your uh, metropolitan planning organization, community development or organizations. Those are really critical uh, support mechanisms as well. Uh, and we're doing our best to work in collaboration with them on this. Uh, our focus, again, really on clean energy. How can we make sure that, that any sort of grant program that comes out from the federal government, that our communities in Ohio know about it, are aware of it, and have the tools that they need to help you know, to apply for it and be competitive. Um, and so what we've done is we've designed a program that provides you know, these educational webinars, grant snapshots. Um, on our website, you can see webinar summaries. So one of the things we heard from communities uh, was that they get a lot of, of input on what to think about a grant, but they need some support and help uh, and thinking about how to how to actually approach it. Um, so that's how we've designed this. We talked to as many cities and, and local government leaders as possible, uh, and we got their input. And these are some of the things we learned. You know, part of it is let's cut the noise. Let's better understand uh, what is out there, what's available. How do we make sure that we we know what makes a competitive applicant? Is is my community a good fit for this? Find alignment where it fits within the the city's strategy and goals. Compete to win. Make sure that. that if we're going to apply for this, that we're as competitive as possible, break the pattern of the rich get richer constantly. These cities that are most resourced oftentimes are the first in line to apply for these. How do we make sure those that have historically not uh, been as competitive or not applied for these have the tools and resources they, they need and want to apply? Um, checking our blind spot, understanding where maybe we're, we're missing an opportunity, where there's uh, op opportunity for innovative uh, approaches to this, uh, non-traditional partners, and then, of course, bring a plan, which is what I want to just spend a couple minutes talking about here as well as I wrap up, because I know I've got, got to hand it off here in a moment uh, to the next speaker. But um, bringing a plan is something that we want to support as, as many communities as possible in doing. Uh, and there's a couple different ways to approach this. Uh, you'll see on this slide that there's, uh, you know, two general concepts when you're thinking about a sustainability plan or a climate action plan. Um, sustainability plan much broader includes a lot of different things. Uh, a climate action plan really focused on emissions. So when you're thinking about how can you reduce your emissions, what are those different levers to pull, what are the different activities within uh, your local government and ways that you can influence your community to think about this um, by setting up a climate action plan. Now, the, the way that your community could approach this uh, depends, on, it depends on where you are with this. If you're just getting started, um, you could look at other sustainability plans. And if you look at some of the big cities that have done these, you'll see these 50, 100 page documents uh, that probably don't seem like a good fit for, for your community. And so the thing about it, making sure to start where, where it makes sense for you all, if, if the uh, end result of this is a five page memo that outlines what you wanna do in this space, uh, that could be just as useful and effective as a hundred page document that includes everything under the sun uh, that could have an impact on these issues. So thinking about what's the right size, what's the right scope, um, establishing that baseline of a 
competitions is that, that critical first step that we can support communities on identifying the right opportunities. So once you have a, a good assessment of that, figuring out how to go forward, making that commitment is really important. Uh, setting a goal and saying, here's where we're, where we're going towards and here's where we want to work together as a community. Educate and build support, getting out to the community members and talking to them, understanding, you know, do they do they have a sense on what this takes? What, what sort of approaches this is going to require to achieve that goal? Uh, engage the community, hear from them, and then finally develop that plan for implementation. Really put, you know, words to a page, making sure that all the right inputs are there. So I'm going to cycle through a couple of slides so I can uh, make sure to get to the, the end here and, and hand it off in time. I know a minute over here. So um, doing great, Joe. Feel free to wrap it up and then we'll we'll hop on to the next. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so these are our core areas of expertise. And, and this, as I touched on, you know, our focus is really around clean energy and clean transportation and climate action. And so uh, across these four areas is where we help support communities. Uh, and we provide, um, you know, that support in terms of, of putting a plan together, but also if there's specific questions, really being a, a think tank of sorts for local governments that want to want to do this work. Um, and these are just some of a few examples of, of how cities can approach this work in, in the you know, city controlled and city influenced sphere. So there's a lot of different ways that cities can do this work, uh, some of which is directly controlled by the city's actions. You know, what are their operations on a day to day basis? How do they uh, deploy clean energy directly via power purchase agreements, uh, purchasing electric vehicles, deploying chargers uh, in public spaces. Um, but there's also a lot of things that cities can do and, and influence in how their uh, community approaches this as well. So whether, whether that's educating residents on energy efficiency opportunities, working with your local utility to do that, um, or providing you know EV charging through workplaces, private workplaces as well, putting together a, a community plan that engages all the different stakeholders. So um, I just say that because there's there's lots of opportunities out there and there's lots of different ways to approach this work. And we want to be helpful to meet communities where they are on this. And so, um, you know, as you are thinking about this, if your community is interested in, in joining PCFO, certainly uh, reach out to me. Um, happy to have a conversation. We've got a growing team that is working on this issue uh, with a great set of experts um, that can be resources for you all. Um, some cities are approaching this, uh, you know, in a very in-depth uh, you know, way in which they're trying to take on all this at once. Other cities are trying to do this just one issue at a time uh, and just want some support and help to think about how to how to do this work. And so um, that's what I want to leave you all with is that, you know, there's there's lots of lots of opportunity out there and understand that there's uh, always help and support uh, needed. And so uh, that's what we've designed this this work with Power Clean Future Ohio to be is, is to be supportive of of what you all need. So with that, I'll go ahead and shop, shop, stop sharing my screen and hand it back over to you. Okay. Joe, thank you. You know, I just wanna say, um, I am incredibly impressed with the saturation of Power Clean Future communities across Ohio. When you showed that map, that was just a really um, exciting thing to see how many communities have embraced Power Clean Future as a as a as a support network as a mission you know these are coming living in a community and being part of growing a community's climate action plan and sustainability goals for the years that i have here in in athens um i i, I think what you pull together as a toolkit is comprehensive and exactly what needs to be done so thank you very much for continuing to advance that work across the state. And um, yeah, we'll uh, look forward to hearing more from you in a bit. So, Thank you, Sarah, I appreciate that. Yeah, and, and to that end, if you have a question for Jake that's, bub or, sorry, for Joe, that's bubbling up right now um, after he shared, drop it in the chat, please. Um, what we're gonna do after each speaker presents is um, kind of just have like a mixed bag question and answer, uh, time allowing. I'll stop gabbing on uh, so that we can get on here. Um, oh, but one more housekeeping thing. Um, there are several folks who have, who you heard from yesterday and today who will be doing one-on-one -on -one consulting this afternoon. You may sign up for that in the chat. I'm thinking Jacob dropped it in there a bit ago and I just haven't looked, but um, feel free to pop in there if that's, if that's helpful to you. If it's not, we totally get it, um, but just know that that opportunity is available uh, this afternoon. Okay, Deb, I'm ready for you. Thank you for getting your screen ready. Um, 
So Deb Perry is with us today. Um, Deb works for Cadmus Group. And if you're not familiar with Cadmus Group, uh, they're an incredible, they're the brains and machine behind the SoulSmart initiative, which is uh, quite an incredible operation, which you'll be learning a lot about from Deb shortly. Um, and Deb is a planner with more than 18 years of experience working to address environmental challenges, particularly the risks associated with global climate change. Uh, Ms. Perry specializes in climate resilience, renewable energy, and decarbonization, and frequently supports local, state, and regional entities in climate planning. Through national programs, including the USDOE's SolarSmart program and Solar Market Pathways program, she's worked to reduce solar soft costs, remove barriers to solar deployment, and accelerate renewable energy development. My kind of gal. All right, Deb, uh, I'm passing it off to you. Take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Does the screen look okay? Sorry, I was messing around um, to get I the right see, projection. I, I think I just, I actually see slide one and it's, um, I can see slide two on the same screen. So would okay. you be able to hit? Um, I thought I had fixed, let's see. Yeah, how does, there, you, still, you did it. That Whatever right. you just did, that okay. was the thing. So, okay. yep, you're good. <laughs> good. Slide, thank you. Um, well, I have to say there are lots of great brands behind SoulSmart. So um, many of them are at Cadmus, but uh, we have a, a great team um, uh, who's been working on the program for many years. So um, really excited to be able to share the program with you and actually really appreciating how well this um, kind of dovetails or, or supplements and complements um, some of the work that Joe talked about. Um, so SoulSmart um, is, is what I'm going to focus on, uh, a, a program that can really help um, local governments to um, support, streamline, accelerate solar deployment within communities. Um, this is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, so I am contractually obligated to show you a disclaimer. Um, what I'm about to say is, is just Deb Perry speaking. I am not speaking on behalf of DOE. Um, so as Sarah said, um, I am at uh, Cadmus, and we are a, a consulting group um, supporting SoulSmart. Um, we are part of a big team uh, led by ICMA and um, IREC, or the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, as well as many other partners with a lot of expertise across a range of issues related to solar, from um, issues of the technology, like energy storage and, um, and, and solar itself, and uh, all of the, the pieces of technology related to that, um, as well as um, permitting and zoning and planning and um, finance uh, so a big team supporting supporting the effort um, soul smart itself as a program so again funded by the department of energy um, the the goal is to help local governments make it faster easier and more affordable um, to go solar um, when i talk about local governments i mean with municipalities as well as counties and, and even regional organizations we actually have a separate um, kind of designation program designed to help uh, councils of governments and uh, regional planning commissions and other regional entities. So they also can kind of get credit for the support that they do, the great work to, um, to support solar in regions across the country. Um, SoulSmart really is a recognition program. Um, it is recognizing the work uh, that it takes to, to take action at the local level, to remove barriers to solar and encourage and support solar in communities. Um, for those of you who watched the Olympics uh, earlier this year, if you were inspired by that, um, SoulSmart also has those three levels, bronze, silver, and gold. Um, again, a recognition program for the work that, that's happening in communities. And I'll talk more about how you attain each of those levels and those recognitions. Um, but to, to do that, to take those actions, um, to achieve those milestones, um, we have a technical assistance program. Um, it's at no cost to the communities and, and can help really take any of the actions that are within the program. And I'll talk more about, about what, what's kind of in, in the technical assistance. Um, SoulSmart definitely has active participation within Ohio already. Um, nine communities already designated and we're working closely with Buckeye Hills Regional Council um, to, to work with even more communities. Um, the gold level, I uh, just want to acknowledge Upper, Upper Arlington has achieved gold status, um, uh, Oberlin and Mid-Ohio RPC in silver, and then um, Amesville, Athens, um, and Athens County, Cleveland, Franklin County, and Somerset have achieved bronze. 
So I, I won't spend a lot of time recapping the benefits of solar development. I know um, you're spending two days really immersed in, in clean energy and why I do this work and what some of these benefits are. Um, but I'll, I'll stay at a fairly high level to say, you know, we believe that solar can have really meaningful impacts for economic development within communities can lead to the creation of new businesses, the, the job opportunities that um, that Joe mentioned. Um, this is a, a field that is growing and growing rapidly. Um, so lots of opportunities for, for work and for, for well-paying jobs. Um, generating power locally has a lot of benefits um, in for, for residents. Uh, Joe mentioned also cost savings um, and, and also stabilizing energy prices. Um, in general, solar produces a more stable um, is, is a more stable cost than uh, relying on purchasing fuels. Having that local generation also enhances local resilience um, and new technologies like solar storage and electric vehicles are always to help um, create more resilient power systems within our communities. Obviously, um, solar could be part of your goals to meet your local climate change and sustainability um, plans, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions, um, you know, solar can have really meaningful impacts there. Ultimately, reducing air pollution and improving local health outcomes um, and can be a part of generating revenue for landowners and communities. Why local action matters. I'm, I'm sure you know folks are aware that states are taking action to support clean energy development and federal action to support clean energy development. But for SolarSmart, we really focus on the local action. Um, and I'm going to show you a graph in a minute. Um, solar costs have been declining over time, um, and definitely systems are becoming more affordable. But a lot of that benefit or that decline has been in what we call hard costs, the cost of the actual panels and, and inverters and the kind of physical hard uh, costs of the system. The other element of, of you know, what these installations cost is, is what we call soft costs. And those are costs associated with getting customers, with permitting, with you know, running your business and, and otherwise um, getting these systems installed. And that element, um, and again, I'll show you a graph, but those soft costs really have been kind of stuck for a while and, and those are hard to reduce. And that's where local action can really have some meaningful impact. Um, streamlining local regulatory processes can uh, reduce the cost of a system by you know, more than $2,000 and onerous processes um, for people to get those installations can really add costs um, in the hundreds of dollars. So there's a lot that you can actually do to help uh, reduce those costs for residents and businesses and make it easier for, for solar installers to do their work. Um, some of those actions, things like municipal installations and leading by example, um, helping to support solarized campaigns, helping to support education and outreach within the community and, and really kind of supporting customer development, if you will, so that when folks call installers, they already know some of the questions to ask. They're already kind of an informed customer. Um, utility engagement, um, local governments can play a really important role in, in helping to um, streamline the process with utilities and um, orient utilities around some of their climate and energy goals. Um, and ultimately, all of those kinds of actions can, can help to reduce solar costs in your community. And if we get a lot of communities doing that, that creates you know, even greater markets, either at those regional scales, state scales. So this is the graph I was, I was talking about. And as you can see, the, um, the cost of solar are declining over time, but that the bulk of that is coming out of that bottom blue band, which is really the cost of the modules themselves. Um, this only goes through 20, the end of 2018. I'll, I'll say things have gotten weird in the past couple of years. Um, so I, I'm not going to show you a, a cost kind of up to today. Um, obviously, supply chain issues and other things, um, inflation. Um, I'm not sure what the, the more recent graph is going to look like, but the blue band across the top um, is uh, you know, showing you some of those sticky um, soft costs that I was talking about, as well as like the in green things like engineering and permitting and, and labor costs, all of those really have kind of um, held and, and those are where we really need to work and, and try to accelerate um, getting costs down. And those soft costs currently account for about 65% of the installations of the system. 
So let me go back to the designation program itself. I mentioned the silver, gold, and bronze levels. Um, how do you how do you get there? How do you participate? Um, Similar to Joe's program, it, it does start with a, a commitment, um, and we ask uh, local governments to send us what we call a, a solar statement or a commitment of their of their interest. Um, and then the designation program itself um, has has points that we award across five categories. Two categories we consider really foundational: that's permitting and inspection, and planning and zoning. Um, these are, are kind of key areas where local governments can take actions, and, and we think um, again these are really foundational. Um, and then three areas of special focus: that's government operations, so actions that the local government can take itself, like putting installations on their own properties or um, changing their own procurements. Um, unit, our community engagement, again things. Uh, related to educating the community and, and helping get the community um, you know, engaged in solar. And then market development um, and actions that, that local governments can help take like solarized campaigns and other things that can really generate a local market. So I wanted to give you a little preview into what it would look like if you um, access our program guide. And there's a link here. Um, the program guide really tells you the, the details of how to work through um, each of the of the, the criteria and to get the points um, and breaks these down um, in pretty detailed ways to be um, make this as easy as possible. And again, there's a technical assistance team available to help with any and all of the of the credits and all of the actions. But just to give you a sense of, of what you'd find there. So actions like um, require no more than two inspections for small rooftop solar. Um, so trying to, again, make this not an onerous process. If you have multiple agencies, if you're fired and building departments, you know, want all to do inspections, how can we um, make sure to consolidate those or streamline those processes, ideally having no more than two inspections for a system. Um, the, at the top, you would be awarded 10 points if you were to pursue this one. Again, none of these are required actions. It's, it's a menu where you pick and choose actions that are appropriate to you. Um, but we give the detail of, of what's included in the action um, and, and some justification about why this is an important action for governments to take. Um, we lay out what would be required to verify that you took this action. Um, this is a Department of Energy program, so we, we do have to have a lot of credibility in awarding these designations. So to, to verify that you did an action usually includes just sending us a link or it could be a memo, um, some documentation that the action was taken. It could be pointing to a specific role within your zoning or something like that. It does require that verification step. Um, we always provide community examples. So even if you don't participate in the program, um, I very much encourage you to use the guide to find examples of communities that have taken actions. We pull those examples from around the country to really try to give folks a, a broad um, kind of view of, of how these actions unfold in, in different regions and different places. Um, so, so in each step, you'll find links to examples and then links to templates um, where these are appropriate. So example checklists or model uh, language for, for ordinances. So for every one of our actions, you can find those, those templates and examples. Um, another one here um, is from the, the market development part of the, of the criteria. Um, this action being supporting a community-wide group purchase program. So basically a solarized program um, within the past five years. Again, examples um, and templates and um, noting this one is 20 points, right? So we give different amounts of points for how difficult the action is and how much effort it takes. But overall, the program guide is, is really a menu. There are a total of 75 credits for a total of 775 points. So there's a lot in there that you can kind of pick and choose your own adventure. To, um, to find the right set of, of actions for you. Um, and then again, the technical assistance program is available um, to help on any of these. So if you're interested in a solarized campaign, if you're interested in looking at whether solar is feasible on your municipal sites, or um, interested in doing some education uh, you know, either webinar series or even workshops. Um, historically, we did those things in person. Um, all of this is available through the technical assistance program. 
Um, we have a, a team with a lot of different expertise, but examples of what could be included, um, we review zoning requirements and we can help engage with you to clarify or streamline language that you have in your zoning. We can review permitting requirements. We offer a lot of training and permitting, both solar and storage related. We can help to train your inspection or permitting staff. Um, we can help do solar feasibility assessments. Um, we can help look at financial finances um, or, or opportunities for incentives. Um, we can help support community education, anything from webinars or fact sheets, or like I said, workshops. Um, we can help uh, develop strategies to reach uh, underserved communities and low income residents. And we can connect you to best practices, things like solarized campaigns, solar procurement, um, CCAs, which Joe also mentioned, and, and incentive programs. So um, I should have written and, and more. Um, really, anything that, that your community is interested in that relates to, um, to credits within the guide um, is, is fair game for the technical assistance program. Uh, there's also great resources on the website so again even if you don't um, fully uh, decide to pursue designation or, or not at this time there's lots of great resources to access um, including a lot of recorded trainings and, and fact sheets and things like that so just going back to that overall designation structure um, showing you that basically at each step, there's slightly more prerequisites um, or required actions um, for the bronze level that's really focused on just as doing a review of your permitting and zoning, um, uh, no real required action there, but just for you to get a set of recommendations about what would, what would be helpful to improve or work on, um, any flags for you that might be barriers to solar, for example. And we ask you to develop an inspection checklist to help residents understand what the requirements are of your inspection um, and then achieve a total of 60 points um, to get to silver we up the ante a little bit we add a couple other prerequisites and the points requirement is to get to 100 points again there's a total of 775 available in the guide so lots of things to choose from on the menu and then gold and um, some additional requirements and a total of 200 points so um, really uh, our technical assistance team is available to help you at whatever level feels right um, for you. And many people kind of come into the bronze level and make it a goal to, to work up to gold over maybe a couple of years, depending on where they're, where they're at. Um, and just a, a quick graphic showing the process. So um, we do encourage you to start, start with the website. Um, there's a lot of good materials there and, and the program guide in particular. Um, which talks you through the process and, and again what those verification documents and things would be. Um, if you're interested, we would then love to schedule a call and talk through what you've already done, where you're really interested in action and, and what um, we might be able to help with. Um, we didn't require um, step four, that written commitment. Um, and then uh, we will provide any assistance to get, um, to get those actions done. Um, an application uh, is it's online and um, we can again help compile all of the verification and get that done um, and ultimately the designation is, a, is an opportunity for publicity um, you receive a plaque from the department of energy um, they often help feature uh, soul smart designees and um, i will say the department of energy has been very excited about this program um, they recently announced it'll be extended for another five years um, and uh, they're investing additional resources into it. So I do think this will continue to be a centerpiece of, um, of how DOE supports local governments on solar. So a lot of excitement there. Um, I think the Department of Energy is going to have a lot of additional um, opportunities for implementation, implementation funding going forward. And um, we're really excited to help communities be well positioned to, um, to take action and receive those funds. And that is my last slide. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, I think I wrapped up on time. Um, you sure did, I'll transition back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so smart, again, I can't speak highly enough of Soul Smart. Um, when it came to this region, I think it was really the game changer we needed. It was the formula. And without a formula, it's a lot of very random bits of street development that um, needs to be comprehensively done. So thank you for 
laying out how that will work or how that work, how that has worked in many, many communities successfully and how we wanna to continue to make that happen in our region. Um, if you are part of the Buckeye Hills Regional Council, involved in any way um, in a community that's served by Buckeye Hills and you haven't yet kind of engaged on the Soul Smart process, by all means, reach out to kind of multiple people here on the call. Um, I mean, Deb, certainly. Uh, you could also check in with Matt Roberts from Sustainable Ohio Public Energy Council. I know he's here. Um, we can also, through oral action, uh, be sure to connect you in. So just one local plug there um, for Soul Smart. Okay, we are on time-ish and that's good. Uh, we'll still have time for a break. Um, I would like, one second, let me get this screen right. Perfect, Lily popped up, thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce Lily Balangi. Uh, she is the transportation specialist serving in the office of the Undersecretary of Transportation Policy at US Department of Transportation. And she's a member of the Routes Initiative. Uh, Routes is the Rural Opportunities to Use Transportation for Economic Success. That's a good acronym, I like it a lot. Um, so I was recently introduced to USCOT's Routes Initiative um, in the last several months as, as they've launched what uh, Lily's gonna be sharing with you today. Um, this electric mobility toolkit, this, this, this is going to, again, be the resource, be the, the, the guidebook. And for each community who's looking for a guidebook, you know, you've got all the tools sitting here uh, when it comes to rural EV infrastructure. So Lily, I'm so glad you could join. And on short notice, um, Rob Hyman's also here and I won't make him, you know, come on screen or anything, but um, Rob and Lily are colleagues in, at DOT. Oh, good. He is popping on um, just for a moment. Yeah. So Rob is um, also a good resource uh, as you're you know, getting to know this uh, route toolkit and want to engage. There you are. Hey, Rob. All right, Lily, I'm going to pass it off to you. And again, um, keep questions coming up in the chat as needed. Thanks, guys. Great. Thanks, Sarah. I just want to confirm that you can see my presentation and you can hear me fine. I see the presentation, I see you, and I can hear you great. Fantastic, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for having us, having me. Um, Rob is available for questions, as we mentioned. Um, but yeah, so I'm here to present um, Charging Forward, a toolkit for planning and funding rural electric mobility infrastructure. Um, the US Department of Transportation recently published this uh, toolkit. It's more colloquially known as the Rural EV Infrastructure Toolkit because we do get that the title is a bit of a mouthful. Um, it's a free and comprehensive resource. It's a kind of one-stop shop, if you will, and I might say that a lot because we like to be that for our, you know, our stakeholders um, as well as everything we create. We like to try to make sure we hit as many important topics at one time. But so the goal is really just to help rural stakeholders scope, plan, and fund um, their EV charging infrastructure. Really, this toolkit is for, you know, any rural entity, um, you know, we're looking at individual property owners, businesses, towns, tribes, uh, planning agencies, anyone really can use this toolkit to identify the key partners um, that need to be engaged on a infrastructure project to take advantage of the planning tools that exist for this, um, and then to also act to help identify the funding that is available to help make this project a reality. Um, so the toolkit, as I mentioned, was developed as part of the uh, department's routes initiative, um, the Rural Opportunities to Use Transportation for Economic Success. I do agree, it's a great acronym. Uh, there is some debate internally, whether it's routes or routes, we'll accept both. Um, in my mind, only one is right, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so the goal of routes really is to, uh, you know, address the disparities in rural transportation infrastructure that we realize exist um, and to help improve the safety and the mobility um, and economic competitiveness of rural communities nationwide. So in doing that, um, the routes initiative and the routes team helps to coordinate DOTs ongoing efforts to support rural communities. And it acts as kind of the central hub for developing 
um, new projects and priorities that are dependent on the transportation needs of rural communities. Um, the routes initiative has technically been around since 2019. However, we were recently codified in the bipartisan infrastructural law. So it really is starting to kind of give us the, the wings we need to make sure that everything um, that you know, has been part of this goal, this objective actually gets to move forward um, with the full weight of the department. So in doing this, we kind of have three core goals uh, to engage rural communities, um, we're, you know, through a series of events, basically realizing that it's important to get the voice and the input from the people who are most likely impacted by this, so that we can work together to help identify the solutions moving forward. Um, we also will harmonize DOT programs internally, as I mentioned, um, acting kind of as the one-stop shop, there it is again, for, uh, you know, anything rural related within the department. Um, in doing that, we, you know, help to establish the Routes Council, which is led by the Deputy Secretary, um, which was also codified in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, and it's basically to make sure that there's consistent messaging, um, consistent you know, assistance, consistent consideration of rural communities and tribal communities, oops, went a little fast, um, as there should be. So lastly, as we kind of look outside of the department, um, the goal of use, utilizing a whole of government approach uh, by partnering with other federal focused federal agencies, Department of Energy, um, Department of Interior, USDA, to help expand our own presence in rural America. In many cases, these other federal agencies just have a little bit more of a comprehensive boots on the ground um, presence. And that's something that we'd like to help leverage and help support um, so that they can promote our resources and vice versa. And we can kind of help capitalize on kind of those synergies and best practices moving forward. Um, so now getting to kind of the, the why are we looking at rural transportation electrification right now? Um, first and foremost, here at the Department of Transportation, we believe that all Americans should have the opportunity to benefit from electric vehicles. Um, and this is especially important in rural communities where EVs can be an especially attractive alternative to conventional vehicles. Um, Rural parts of the country are home to 20% of Americans and almost 70% of America's road miles. Um, similarly, rural residents drive more than their urban counterparts. On average, that's actually about 10 miles more per day, um, which really starts to add up, not to mention they spend more on vehicle fuel and maintenance and often have fewer alternatives um, you know, to driving to meet their transportation needs. We don't have you know, the metro in rural, you know, Ohio, I know, or rural West Virginia, which is where I'm from. Um, so it's important to kind of consider these opportunities as they arise. So why now? The next part of this question. Uh, President Biden announced a goal that by 2030, there'll be a national network of 500,000 EV chargers and 50% of all new vehicles sold in the U.S., uh, will be zero emissions vehicles. And that's fantastic, something to really work towards. Additionally, um, the bipartisan infrastructure law did include $7.5 billion in funding for new EV chargers and other alternative fueling infrastructure. And then lastly, you know, uh, there are, you know, well, lastly, all these are very important. Um, and then so important of the, in support of these important activities, uh, the Rural EV Infrastructure Toolkit helps to kind of consolidate the guidance and federal opportunities that exist already to help rural entities plan and fund um, EV chargers. So now the actual formal introduction, if you will, to the toolkit. Uh, it is structured to include basics of EV infrastructure, um, realizing that some people are starting from the ground up types of EV charging available, tips on planning and partnerships, um, funding and financing resources. It also walks through a project planning checklist that is very helpful um, that I'll di dig into a little bit more later, provides technical advice on project scoping and utility, installation, um, operational planning. It also compiles helpful tools and resources for cost analysis, uh, for charging needs assessment, equitable planning opportunities, um, et cetera. The same thing and more, let's, you know, let's add. Um, so included in that, we want to kind of really pick, take, a take a chance, excuse me, to focus on the benefits that are available to individuals specifically. Um, you know, namely here we see on this 
overarching slide, lower, owner, lower ownership costs. Um, electric motors are inherently more efficient. Um, you know, that's just simply how it is. So we're finding that electric vehicles are, they have a higher energy efficiency. Um, they have lower fuel costs and lower maintenance costs on the low, uh, on the long term, excuse me, than similar uh, conventional vehicles. EVs often use regenerative brakings, uh, which saves a lot of money in the long term. And the lifetime EV maintenance and repair costs are often up to 50% lower than conventional vehicles. Um, and since EVs have a far fewer moving parts, they tend to last a little longer and they don't require as much of a costly engine, less maintenance, uh, you know, really saves in the long term for the individual. Uh, we do realize that there is a higher upfront cost currently. That's something that you know I think a lot of people are working towards to try to make that more accessible in the in the near future, hopefully. Um, similarly, the accessible fueling infrastructure, EVs can be charged at home, work, community sites, grocery stores, um, and other locations that offer parking with EV chargers. This makes it more convenient for rural America or for or for excuse me, for people living in rural America where you're more likely to have, you know, have a driveway um, or something along those lines. So that helps having that availability for off-street parking. Um, similarly, you know, DC fast chargers uh, have been coming online with along rural corridors with many more as this bipartisan infrastructure law funding becomes available. So we're really looking to see, um, you know, the opportunity to charge at home, as well as you know, on your daily commute, on your travels, um, and building it into part of your life, just like we have already in terms of the gas stations, you know, everywhere you go. <laughs> um, secondly, or thirdly, expanding vehicle options. Um, so, you know, in 2019, there were only 72 light duty EV models. Uh, or there are, excuse me, as many as 72 light duty EV models back when there was only one in 2010. Um, so we're already seeing this increased competition among automakers that has led to a very fast expansion of the EV market. Um, and it's only gonna keep growing. You know, We're seeing such a wide investment in terms of light duty vehicles, uh, pickup trucks, sedans, SUVs. I think there was even conversation of, you know, like a, a freight, truck potentially going EV now. So there's really lots of opportunities for any individual, any need. Um, and there's a lot of commitment from these OEMs to release new EV models as we're moving forward. Um, lastly, we have the increased resilience. So EVs with bi-directional chargers can actually help serve as a backup power source in place of deal generators um, during extreme weather events, which is something that we've been seeing a lot more lately, um, you know, so having that kind of availability to store electricity in an EV battery can offer safety and comfort and convenience um, for rural households during power outages, for example. Um, and so, yeah, this is a new opportunity that we're kind of seeing come on board of another reason that, uh, you know, having an electric vehicle can really benefit you and your needs as they, as they change, as they arise, and in the case of an emergency. There are also some incredible, you know, community benefits that EVs can bring to rural areas on a broader scale. Um, for example, public EV charging can spur an economic activity uh, in rural communities. So as both local and visiting EV drivers are inclined to stop and charge, they will spend a little bit more time and hopefully a little bit more money uh, visiting local businesses as they charge their EVs. And this is something that we're seeing. Um, we've been having, you know, the routes team has been having a lot of conversations and part of our engaging stakeholders part of that objective um, with local communities who have instituted and installed EV chargers in their, in their communities, at their town center, you know, near their hotels. Um, and they're, for the most part, I, I don't think I will, I don't believe we've seen anyone say that they haven't, you know, seen some increased economic development in local revenue, just because it's bringing in tourists, it's bringing in travelers who would have otherwise, um, you know, sideswept a small town, for example. At the same point, it is benefiting the local residents who can use those on their daily lives. Uh, we also have the benefit of improved public health. Uh, battery electric vehicles produce no tailpipe emissions and less brake dust pollution when compared to conventional vehicles. Um, you know, this is becoming very important, obviously, as we're looking at uh, climate change and global health uh, long term. 
This also kind of leads into the next one of lower greenhouse gas emissions, uh, where EVs do produce lower emissions than conventional vehicles, uh, especially when the electricity itself is generated with renewable sources, which is an important piece to add. Still, we realize that you know, there are some, some challenges that do still exist uh, for rural areas who are looking to invest in uh, EV infrastructure and you know, the ability to deploy EVs in the first place. Um, these include things like high upfront costs, which I previously mentioned. Uh, the fact that it is a longer distance between sites, obviously, um, in, in rural communities. The potential need for grid upgrades, um, which I know has been kind of discussed previously, um, just realizing that not everyone has the availability um, to accommodate the electric vehicle you know, requirements, um, as well as just general kind of low awareness where people may not be aware of what does exist for them, what is available for them. Um, typically, you know, rural communities have had less exposure to EV technology than urban communities. We have realized that um, so those project developers do need to navigate some unfamiliar permitting, perhaps, or citing, uh, you know, instances when implement, implementing EV infrastructure projects. Um, and so for the goal of this rural EV toolkit is to help provide guidance and discuss these, you know, these challenges, as well as emerging solutions to help address them moving forward. Um, so this, this audience, like I mentioned, um, any rural entity really can use this toolkit to help identify their key partners, um, to take advantage of the planning tools, to identify the funding that is available to them. It is intended specifically, um, you know, like I said, rural stakeholders in general. We do list some here just to kind of spell it out to include states, which includes state departments of transportation, state departments of energy, uh, local communities, tribes. Uh, transportation providers, nonprofits, businesses, individuals, you name it, we probably have it. Um, and it is used, meant to kind of be a source, if you will. It doesn't have to be a linear, you know, step-by-step. -step. It's more of a use what you use, use what you need and move on. Um, so the partnership opportunities, uh, this toolkit also helps to explain the diverse partnerships that can help to support rural communities in planning, funding, implementing EV infrastructure, um, this includes statewide, multi-state, and tribal partners, uh, you know, groups planning for EV corridors, state DOTs, state environmental and energy agencies, uh, multi-state initiatives working on climate change, like vehicles, et cetera. The local and regional planning partners tend to include clean cities coalitions, transportation planning agencies that can help align EV infrastructure projects with transportation planning efforts um, and that funding, which is available electric utilities uh, who help provide technical advice on connecting to the grid and often take ownership of um, you know, the general aspects of installation, charging networks, um, which can sometimes own, operate, maintain uh, the stations themselves, as well as the site hosts who provide the dedicated space uh, for the charging installation. And as I mentioned, this could include tourism and destinations, local businesses, you know, municipal community sites, um, you know, town property, whatever you have. Um, and so these two maps uh, do include kind of the Clean City Coalition on the, on the top, um, as well as the EV corridors, which are currently uh, listed as uh, on FHWA's Alternative Fuel Corridors Program as either being ready or, you know, almost ready for uh, the EV charging. So previously I did mention briefly the uh, project planning checklist. Um, so this is one of the many tools included in the toolkit um, seen here. And it, so it helps to kind of take the guesswork out of planning and ensuring that you know, planners know what to consider in the process of implementing their infrastructure. It goes into project development and scoping, utility planning, installation planning, operational planning. Um, it kind of works to hit the, 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 you know, the high point, if you will, um, a reminder of what you, what you should think of if you haven't yet. Um, and so it helps, like I said, to, to provide some technical guidance, um, which, is, which is great. Additional resources included in the toolkit are, uh, you know, a compilation of planning tools um, that includes some equity related resources, as well as calculators, um, interactive maps, 
um, and just other general kind of reference documents, many of which are kind of illustrated here as just a little, a little bit of a little tease, if you will. Um, and so the toolkit also includes, and one of the kind of highlights of the toolkit, I'll say, is a table of funding opportunities that are organized by agency um, with the information on eligibility for applicants, funding amounts, and types of projects that are eligible for funding. So this table actually spans like 11 pages in the toolkit. It's also available online as a filterable list. So I do realize it is, it is a lot. It's very comprehensive, which was the goal. Um, and it includes programs from other federal agencies, um, as well as you know, various projects um, or availability that comes from grants and loans and tax incentives. So it is, it's a very comprehensive uh, matrix, very useful, um, recommend digging into it, um, you know, playing around with it and seeing what works. So with all that information, I guess the question is what's the next steps? What's the plan for, you know, the rest of this year, if you will. Um, so we have been holding a series of stakeholder workshops with rural communities to test drive the toolkit. Um, we have planned 10 workshops and this outreach is really going to look at working directly with communities who have an interest, excuse me, who have an interest um, or who have already engaged in installation of electric vehicle charging infrastructure so that we can get their feedback um, to better kind of understand, did we hit the mark? Did we miss the mark? Are there other needs and priorities um, that rural communities have that we did not appropriately consider or we, you know, we truly wanna make it as comprehensive and as usable and user-friendly as possible. So the goal is to collect this input and data from these stakeholders um, representing various different communities and groups. You know, we're looking at different regions, different level of engagement, in EV, um, tribal communities. And then we're going to consolidate all that and put it into a revised toolkit that we're hoping to be published um, or released later this summer. And they'll also include not only the feedback, but um, some expanded information on electric transit vehicles, school buses, um, micromobility being a big topic uh, in terms of electrification. And then lastly, because of timing of our publication for this version, which came out in February, um, and the continued resolution that we were under, we were unable to really include anything from the bipartisan infrastructure law. So uh, the next iteration will have a lot more information um, as it pertains to that. So um, just kind of a general plug, which I will definitely plug again shortly, is that we you know, encourage all sorts of feedback. So this is a great opportunity as well. Um, if you have information that you think we should have included, um, please let us know. So as part of these workshops, we're actually um, going to be holding a small focus group workshop, if you will, uh, with Ohio. Thank you to Sarah for her coordination with that on March 30th. Um, and so we do have some represent uh, representatives who may or may not be here today. Um, so feel free, like I mentioned, to kind of, if you have information that you'd like to get filtered to us or through us, you can either reach out to us directly, or I'm sure, uh, you know, Sarah wouldn't mind uh, helping out there as well. So we want to make sure we have everyone's um, information. Fortunately, we can't include everyone, um, but, you know, we do want to have that input. So I'll just leave you now um, with this last little, little information, little slide. Um, the toolkit is available in a browsable form online, as well as a um, downloadable PDF, so that they're both included here in these links. Um, I also, you know, recommend that you explore our routes website, transportation.gov slash rural, um, which includes all the other resources we have available as well. Um, and, you know, it, that is where the rural the department's rural uh, kind of coordination takes place. So we, at the very least, link to everything that exists, that we hope exists, that we know exists, if you will, um, in the department. You can also subscribe to our email list um, and that'll help keep you informed on all things routes. Um, so with that, I will leave you and thanks so much. Lily, thank you. And I apologize for not acknowledging uh, during your little, during my bio intro to you that you're from West Virginia. That is absolutely notable, a very a big point of pride, I'm sure for many of us here who, you know, love our town. So um, yeah, glad and glad to see that you um, uh, 
are doing such important and valuable work. Um, I think this uh, this toolkit, I mean, I know it, I'm sure it took quite some time to plan and uh, plenty of people uh, pulling this together. The timing was perfect. Uh, your launch of the Routes Toolkit, I think came at the absolute best moment. Um, again, the listening session on March 30th will give us a chance to give feedback on the toolkit. But um, for those who are maybe aware of this, um, the Department of Transportation announced just in late February that uh, they are allocating quite a lot of funding through the NEVI initiative, National Electric Vehicle Initiative, for states to take advantage of. Um, the states are underway with planning and how they will spend those NEVI dollars. Um, if you are interested in getting engaged and saying, here's where charging stations ought to be, um, the funding will cover national highway infrastructure development in each state as a first priority, but for that second priority and tier, you know, um, byways and I, I hope and assume and would imagine there's going to be some uh, critical funding for uh, rural infrastructure, EV infrastructure as well. So um, please get engaged, you know, I, I'm keeping my finger on the pulse of this one quite closely. So if you have any questions or want to kind of stay in tune on this, besides reaching out to Lily or Rob, um, I'm happy to help keep you connected and in the loop as well. So thank you again. Um, I'd like to turn our attention now over to Jake Cuss. Um, Jake is joining us today in his role. He wears many a hat, but uh, today the hat I've asked him to join us wearing is as the assistant director at the Utility Scale Solar Energy Coalition. So we're talking utility scale here for those of us who kind of need a visual. Those are the big solar farms. We're not talking rooftop residential solar. We're not talking even a small scale, like even a school or a um, hospital. We're talking big solar here. And um, ready or not, here that comes too. As we heard from Dale yesterday, there is um, quite a push for development in the utility scale space here in Ohio and specifically in Southeast and Southern Ohio because of you know a lot of factors, um, the seasonality, the, the aspect of the sun, the price of land, the um, access to critical infrastructure. And I'm sure Jake's gonna go into all of this, but um, pay attention to this one too huge game changer when it comes to economic development. So uh, I really appreciate you coming, Jake. It, this means a lot to me and um, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Oh, and I'm sorry, I don't read these things very well. Here's Jake's quick bio. <laughs> um, he manages the day-to-day -day operations at Utility Scale Solar Energy Coalition. Um, and it's 25 member nonprofit that represents the industry leaders in the state of Ohio. Um, their goal is to meet the demand for clean energy and drive economic development that benefits Ohio's communities, schools, and rural landowners. So sitting at the helm of a lot of really important decision making in the state. Um, all right, Jake, uh, I see your screen. I see you. I bet we'll be able to hear you. Great. So uh, take it away. And again, folks, drop, drop anything in the chat. Oh, and one last thing. I'm sorry. One last thing. If you do want to make some time this afternoon with the one-on-one -on -one consulting and coaching, um, that list is still up. Uh, Jay will do another drop. If you want to join, great. If not, of course, we understand and we'll be sending out resources later um, from everyone you heard from. Okay, your turn, Jacob. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate it. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Jake Coase. I'm the Assistant Director um, at USEC. I know it's it's a long name, so we go by USEC. Uh, it's, it's a lot quicker than our, our full title there. But like Sarah mentioned, um, you know, we've touched on solar over the past few, uh, you know, presentations and sustainability and electrification. Um, we are hyper focused on utility scale solar here in the state. Um, and that really is delineated by projects that are 50 megawatts and above. Um, so like Sarah mentioned, those are projects that are you know 300 acres and larger um, so it really is larger scale um, we're talking huge swaths of land and so um, you know and, and kind of as I walk through our presentation here try and keep that in mind um, you know we uh, obviously support solar of all sizes but that's what our focus has been um, since since the beginning 
And like Sarah mentioned, uh, you know, we, we represent, we're a trade association. And so we represent a lot of developers and manufacturers here in the state um, on these utility scale projects. Um, and so whether it's representation at the Ohio Power Siting Board that falls under the Public Utilities Commission um, or working with legislators throughout the state, um, you know, however we can help our developers and our members um, kind of proliferate utility scale solar here in the state um, is really what we're trying to do. And so, you know, usually the first question we get is kind of why Ohio? Um, and a lot of folks know that if we're not the sunniest state uh, in the U.S. And, you know, I'm looking out my window at a, at a gray sky today. But if you start to think about all of the different factors that go into utility scale solar, that's why Ohio makes a lot of sense. As you can see on the, on the screen there, there are a number of factors that go into this. Uh, geography is a huge one. Uh, we fall within the PJM grid, which covers a lot of Ohio and east uh, toward the eastern seaboard with a huge population, tons of industry. Um, and on that grid, um, there's not a lot of available land and there's not a lot of available flat land. Um, so portions of Ohio make a ton of sense in terms of, you know, already kind of uh, tilled land, greenfield development. It's already being used for an agricultural purpose or a commercial purpose. Um, it's, you know, we're not disturbing forests or anything like that. Um, it's working on land that has already been developed in some way. Um, and so you, you start to think about where we fall within the U.S., the topography that we have um, kind of goes into why Ohio makes a lot of sense. Um, if you go eastern toward New Jersey or, or Maryland or places like that, they're already so developed. There's not a ton of land available for large scale utilities, utility scale solar. Um, so <clears throat> you kind of think about the physical, that makes a lot of sense. Stepping back and thinking about it from an, a business standpoint, um, we have one of the largest panel manufacturers in the world um, with their production headquarters here in the U.S., um, up by Toledo and Perrysburg, and that's First Solar. Of the 10 largest panel manufacturers in the world, they are the only one uh, located here in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and so that's a huge point of pride for Ohioans when we talk about large scale solar um, and really solar of any kind. And then you start to think about the demand for solar. Um, you know, I'll touch on it later, but everybody here in the state and nationwide has heard about Intel's $20 billion announcement um, here in Ohio. And that comes with a huge, huge new energy need here in the state. Um, and so when you start to think about that in Intel's requirement of 100% renewable energy by 2030, that has to come from somewhere. And that's coming from new renewable development here in the state. Um, so it's not only something that we're seeing from communities like Joe touched on, some communities and villages and, and counties are pushing for new renewable energies, but it's something that the businesses are counting, accounting for. And a lot of the new development that we see here in the state are coming from folks that have very high standards um, internally for their sustainability metrics, uh, renewable energy metrics, and things like that. I touched on the sun that does come in the state. You'll see a few maps here. Um, on the left is kind of the average. And you'll notice that in the far southwest of the, of the country here, that's where you get the most sun. That's that deep red. Um, and Ohio is kind of the pale, orange, yellowish color. But if you move into July, you'll see that all of the country gets plenty of sun. Um, and I can assure you, projects of these size that are hundreds of millions of dollars, none of these companies would be investing this type of money in Ohio if it didn't make sense. Um, you know, at the levels that we're talking about here in Ohio, um, solar at this level is cost competitive with any type of power generation. Um, and so even though we have gray days and gray weeks and things like that, if you think about kind of peak times for electric usage in the summer when air conditioning's on, during the day when industry's running, Ohio's sun that does hit the ground is mirroring those curves. Um, and so there, there really is no lack of sunshine here in Ohio when you're talking about solar of the scale. Um, it, it makes economic sense, it's completely feasible. Um, otherwise folks wouldn't be looking to the state to, to make that happen. And I touched on you know, Ohio being a solar leader, um, especially regionally here in the Midwest. Um, first, solar is a big point of pride. Ohio ranks seventh in the nation in renewable energy labor force. Um, and so that's, that's a big deal in terms of, you know, thinking about these kind of new renewable energy assets that are coming up in the state. 
Um, you know, each of these sites requires hundreds of new jobs, um, you know, during the construction period. Um, and it's, it's something that, you know, I'll touch on a little bit, but there's a huge job growth opportunity when you're talking about utility scale solar. Um, but aside from the panels that we touched on with first solar, a recent study out of Ohio University showed that of the other components going into utility scale solar um, projects, 30% of those components are coming from manufacturers here in the state. And that's largely, um, you know, metals and wiring and different components that are being driven into the ground to basically house these solar panels. Um, so aside from the panels themselves, a lot of the materials that are being brought onto these job sites are coming from Ohio manufacturers. And so there's um, there is a local boon in that way that it's helping you know, other industries aside from large scale solar developers. We touched a little bit on um, kind of businesses that are requiring high renewable energy standards. Um, I've listed some up here. And a lot of those groups are part of REBA, the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance or the RE100. Um, but more locally here in the state, you have kind of long-term legacy groups like GM, Honda, P&G, Fifth Third, um, who are requiring, whether through um, you know, assets here in the state um, or assets throughout the US, that they're requiring very high levels of renewable energy for their own portfolios. Um, and I threw Intel in there on the side um, Intel could be upwards of 7.5 gigawatts of brand new energy need here in, needed here in the state, which is a huge number. Um, and it's, it's just kind of phase one and two of a several phase um, outlook for what Intel's planning here in the state. And so when you kind of think about this, one of our board members likes to talk about a bathtub. And if you think about all the drains that are in this bathtub who need electricity, and all the different spouts that are going into the bathtub to provide that electricity, we're at a point right now where there's room in the bathtub for additional water. Um, and effectively that needs to be renewable energy uh, because a lot of these companies are requiring that here in the coming decades. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of a near-term opportunity for Ohio to take advantage of this. Um, it's something that you know, might not be on the table. Capacity might be full in 20 years, you know, but here in the near term, it's a huge opportunity for Ohio to step in and become a leader um, when you talk about renewable energy development here in the Midwest. I touched on the 2020 report from Ohio University, and here are just a few more points from that. You know, I, I noted that Intel alone might require 7.5 gigawatts, but at the time of this study, that was kind of the, the high watermark for um, you know, potential near-term solar development in the state. And some of the numbers that come off of that in a 40-year term and we use 40 years because typically uh, that's the length of kind of the land lease deals um, in terms of the actual physical land being used. Um, but it could lead to an $18 billion economic impact in the state, um, over 54,000 construction jobs. Um, and with that point, I like to note that this isn't in a one to two year period. It will take a decade plus to build out this type of, of infrastructure. And so those jobs will be stretched out. You know, it's not going to be a spike in 2022 and 2023. It's something that will, uh, it will have a long tail while these projects are being developed. Um, but locally for the, the jurisdictions that house these developments, it's $67 million in annual tax revenues, uh, which you know, comes to the point of over $2.8 billion collectively um, for these local entities. And it's really the counties that are seeing uh, the benefits from these types of projects. So there's Obviously, there's huge op opportunity for solar development, but in terms of kind of local impact, there are uh, you know very tangible benefits aside from uh, the renewable energy that's being developed. There are tangible economic benefits for those local entities as well. Um, and so, kind of at a state level, you know, we talk about the opportunity to bring massive economic development opportunities. Intel would not have come to Ohio if it couldn't source renewable energy. Um, their mark is 100% renewable energy by 2030, um, and that's going to be here before we know it. And I'm sure that with a $20 billion investment in the state, they knew that they could source renewable energy here. Um, and so it, it's not just those companies, it's from municipalities and counties and cities as well. Um, and it's kind of a, you know, a groundswell of folks that are starting to require renewable energy at a very high level. And as we touched on locally, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for jobs. 
Um, and there's, you know, depending on how you look at it for the landowners, this is an economic opportunity that, you know, far outweighs what, you know, farmers can typically, typically get from soybeans and corn. Um, it's an opportunity for, you know, generations who might not be interested in keeping the farming portion of that land going, but being able to keep that land in the family um, through, through contracts like this. Um, and another point of emphasis is that these projects all carry decommissioning, uh, you know, plans. And so at that 40 year mark, once that uh, contract is up, if the landowners want that land to be converted back to agricultural land, there's been a bond set aside to do that. Um, and there are studies that show that that land will be healthier than it was when the installation went in because it will have essentially sat there I mean, kind of regenerated for, for 40 years at that time. So there are benefits beyond that. And it's, it's not a permanent thing. You know, you're not putting down giant concrete slabs or anything like that. You're driving poles into the ground that can be pulled back out um, at the end of the project. And so it's, it's something that is, it's, it's a long-term 40-year deal, but at the end of that 40 years, if the land wants to get back to agricultural purpose, it, it definitely can. Here's a quick snapshot of kind of current utility scale solar development in the state. And you can see that there's a pretty heavy focus on uh, Western Ohio. Um, and those are the flatter, more agricultural areas. Um, but I wanted to pull up a little bit of a focus in Southeast Ohio and Southern Ohio. Um, I know in the Buckeye Hills region and those counties, <clears throat> there's currently no utility scale solar development, but you can see um, kind of in the ARC counties from Brown County, Highland and Adams, and East, that there's a lot of development in Southern Ohio. Vinton and Jackson um, also have development. And then in kind of the Northern counties that fall under that, um, Harrison and Columbiana also have utility scale solar development. And so it's something that might not be in effect right now, um, but it, it's just a, 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 you know, an opportunity to find the land that makes sense. Um, and one thing I'd like to highlight is that <clears throat> All of these utility scale solar projects need to be within a couple miles of high voltage transmission lines. And thanks to Ohio's industrial pass, you know, you can see here on this map, it's, it's a little complicated here, but these dark blue lines that are running through here are existing uh, transmission lines that meet that need. So you can see Eastern Ohio is littered with high transmission lines. Um, and so there's, there is definite opportunity across the state it's just finding the land that you know correlates with uh, you know a high transmission line that is close to an entity needing that renewable energy, and so the opportunity is there. Um, you know, while kind of the hilly territory in southeast Ohio might make it a little bit more difficult, it doesn't mean that utility scale uh, can't function in that area. And so it's it's something that is coming down the line, um, and I'm glad that Dale touched on it yesterday. Ohio is positioned for a, a, a boom in, in solar energy at this time. I mean, it, it, we really had the opportunity to become a leader a, in the Midwest, especially when it comes to utility scale solar. Um, so I kind of wanted to get quickly through that. I know we, we have time for Q&A after. Um, feel free to reach out to uh, me. I put our website and my email address up there. Um, you know, we are a trade association representing developers, but we take a lot of time on presentations like this to educate. Um, you know, in talking to county commissioners and township trustees, uh, there's a lot of misinformation and just a gap of knowledge around what solar energy can be for your community. Um, and so we always like to be an advocate and a, and a, you know, a wealth of resources for folks who are trying to learn more about what it might mean for your community. Jake, thank you so much. Um, that was the presentation I've been needing to get a handle on the state of play for utility scale solar in Ohio. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a couple questions in the chat though. I'm gonna just throw one, um, well, before I do that, can each of our presenters hop on please so we can all see your faces. Great, thank you all. Um, I, yes. Perfect. Um, I really want to begin just by saying like, you know, here we are in this um, moment, you could say, um, I'm thinking to what Jake just shared about Ohio's, you know, short term opportunity for investment in utility scale solar. Um, we know the residential market is primed. 
uh, across the board, renewable energy is about to explode. And, you know, thank you to everyone who's kind of brought this back home to how this impacts Southeast Ohio. Um, I want to, I guess, throw out um, a question that kind of, um, you know, you've each touched on, but uh, maybe someone wants to take take a lead on saying, you know, if what does five years from now look like? Actually, I'm going to put this one to Jake because he was the last to speak. What does five years look like in Southeast Ohio with the right investment in utility scale solar? What what could it look like if we followed the best practice of of development in utility scale? I think the next five years are going to be very telling for what utility scale solar is going to look like in the state. Um, you know, there's there are currently two sites that are under operation generating right now, um, but there are upwards of you know 50, 70 plus that are in the application process. Um, so this really is a time where utility scale solar is going to grow um, in leaps and bounds. For Southeast Ohio, um, you know, I mentioned a couple of counties, Fenton and Jackson, where that's you know in the application process that it's in the process of getting to construction and things like that. There are opportunities for counties and local entities to kind of keep the door open for that type of, of development. Um, and we're seeing, you know, there are counties that have gone through this in the past where they are seeing kind of the economic benefits coming out of utility scale solar. Um, there's a portion of it called the pilot program, payment in lieu of taxes, where that county is guaranteed a certain amount of, of tax income essentially tied to that project. Um, and it's earmarked for school districts, police departments, fire departments, things like that, where communities who might not otherwise be flush with cash um, to kind of benefit local municipal needs will have that opportunity. Um, and so there are a number of, you know, kind of, you know, feel good stories around the state where communities have started to realize what those benefits look like, um, have seen a kind of an influx of opportunity to impact their communities in a great way. Um, and so there's there are definite items tied to these projects to benefit those local communities at the county level um, to ensure that you know it's not extractive that the county is not just giving up land um, but it's it's also benefiting from these types of projects so it's it's an opportunity to keep the door open for sure um, but to start to realize what those gains might look like and, and really see what that kind of county level influx of of tax income can can do for your community. Yeah. Um, Jay Warnke has a question actually to follow on to that. Um, and this was one that came up in my head too. Um, he's heard some pushback already about utility solar taking productive farmland out of production. Um, and is there any movement to prioritize siting based on the marginal nature of the land? And yes, is the answer. House Bill 450 uh, might be an answer, but we don't need to go too detailed into that. What, what would you, oh, and he, sorry, second part. In the past, PUCO pushed against, pushed back against utility solar. I recall them crushing a project at the wilds in Muskingum County. Are they now more supportive to utility solar? What say you to that, Jake? Uh, the PUCO and the Ohio Power Siding Board <clears throat> have a, you know, a very detailed process to get through. For any of these utility scale projects, folks are going through a multi-year, uh, you know, multi-million dollar process just to get to the point of construction. Um, and so I think it's not exactly whether or not the PUCO and the OPSB are pro or anti-solar, it's whether or not, um, you know, the, the right level of red tape is there, if that sounds right. But there's a lot to be done before getting to construction. Um, and the, the OPSB and the PUCO have been approving projects um, every couple of months. They have been recommending denial for a few projects as well, but on the whole, it's been generally positive as long as the developers and the communities are working together to figure out what makes sense. Um, and they're ticking all of the boxes that go into that process. By the time it gets to the Ohio Power Siding Board, um, staff is recommending approval, I mean, it's moving on to kind of the official process where projects get approved. Um, and once they get approved, um, that's when construction can start. And so um, it's a very lengthy process. There are a lot of details that go into it, a lot of studies that go into it. 
Um, so no, I wouldn't say that the OPSB or the PUCO is anti in any way. It's, it's just a very stringent process to get through. Um, and some projects do, do fail to get through that process. So I'm gonna put, kind of put this question out and anyone on the, um, who's, who's joined today as a presenter might, might have a comment on this. Um, solar installations on farmland, we're talking you know, ground mount solar, could, could be set up high enough to plant beneath. And um, is there a way to ensure this for those willing to give up their land, um, for those who are trying to plan a solar plus land management uh, strategy. Um, is there anything, Deb and SoulSmart around that? Or I don't know, Joe, if you've encountered that in a community that's really trying to prioritize that with legislation or ordinance changes. Anyone want to share on that? Um, I'll, I guess I'll just say that um, historically, a lot of the SoulSmart um, work has, has been focused more on, on residential scale solar, but um, DOE is seeing this trend and has flagged for us um, that basically in, in the coming year or so, we'll be doing a lot more I think, to support communities on large scale solar. And so um, there is some work not associated with SolSmart, but from DOE um, called Solar at Scale, um, which is a really great guidebook and gives lots of examples of best practices, including things like how to make sure um, you know, pollinators are still supported and opportunities for grazing and other kind of um, co coexisting with agricultural uses. Um, so I'd encourage folks to look at solar at scale. I can put it in the in the chat. Um, and SolSmart definitely will be doing more work in this space going forward. That's really exciting to hear. I'm going to check that out. Absolutely. Anyone else want to add to that? Oh, I don't have too much to add to that. I would just say that um, most of our work with uh, cities and municipalities is around uh, what usable land they have uh, within their own uh, properties. So near wastewater treatment facilities, a high consumer of energy, um, you know, floating solar is quickly something that, that is becoming uh, more and more applicable for cities on top of, of some of the reservoirs, um, certainly rooftop solar. Uh, as well. So there's all kinds of, of creative ways to do it. And then in terms of, of planting and those things, one thing that I always uh, counsel local governments on is to, to push the solar companies that are uh, applying for these and, and really ask them, uh, ask them what they could do, uh, look for innovative ideas out there and, and ask them to consider them and see what sort of proposals they get back. Uh, I promise you this is, is, is not the first time they've, they've heard the question and they probably have, can look to other projects that either they have done or others have done uh, to help, you know, serve the interests of the community. So uh, push them and ask for it. Yeah, I will underscore that. I think accountability for the installers, um, helping them to understand a community's needs and priorities and how to best serve the communities is a, a great thing to do. And I think it's, it just makes us all better when we can, you know, strive for this kind of, you know, accountability, whether it's environmental accountability, quality assurance. Um, we live in a place, rural places, very few of them have building codes, very few of them have stringent, if any, permitting processes. There's no one coming out to inspect these solar arrays. That's an important fact that, and, and a scary thing to me when I know that, well, we have some amazing solar installers in our community who have done great work, and have, have been uh, exceptional examples of a good solar company. We've also had some people in our community who are businesses trying to serve our community who are not nearly as um, mindful or uh, professional or, you know, and, and maybe installing something that just does not work for a community member. And I, I worry about that. I think about that a lot. And accountability is really important in the industry. So. Um, whether that's residential or utility scale, um, this, this dialogue is really important. <laughs> Turning to Kate's question, um, she's saying that many of our communities have a solar array, oh, have, have solar array companies reach out to them about land to put, uh, to put their arrays on. How do we frame negotiations to these companies to ensure that the community sees a benefit from these arrays and to ensure that they are not using developable land. For example, one county is dealing with solar array companies only wanting to use flat land. 
which takes away from ag and manufacturing when these array companies can use hillsides. Great point, absolutely important. Um, I also encourage, Dale, are you still here? Um, maybe you pop on, because I know this is also something that you um, have experienced. Yeah. I, uh, can you see me okay? Yes, go right ahead. Okay, you had a question. Um, no, Jake brings some very interesting things and I've been in on the discussion of the whole thing. As a matter of fact, Jake and I are meeting next week. Hi, Jake, nice to see you again. Um, well, welcome to my world. Um, all over the state, and I alluded to it yesterday, the discussion with regard to trying to find that balance with regard to utility scale solar development and utilization of farm ground is absolutely huge. I've been involved in over 90 Ohio Power Siding Board proceedings with regard to permitting. I spend a lot of time, at least four times a week with kitchen table meetings with farmers and families who are taking a look at leasing and different things and how to create and strike this balance that can keep them on the farm, can benefit their schools, can benefit their community and do a number of things basically at once. I think a lot of people are finding too that if you really want this type of development, you are going to have to find a balance with regard to give and take going forward. Uh, the focus is, well, I wanna remain green, but as long as I don't have to worry about that on my property, I'm gonna be as green as possible. But when you have to take a look at that, your community is going to have to make some plans your community is going to have to investigate, investigate, uh, investigate in, um, invest in infrastructure that you're going to have to find a balance. Many of the things I talked about yesterday is, is, is huge, and that basically is, is, is going to be very much discussion over the next several decades. Um, yeah. That as easy as it gets. And I tell you, again, I don't want you to drink from a fire hose, but if you want to talk about this further, be more than happy to do this offline, be more than happy to do some programs and different things with rural action down there, what's going on in the state. And I've been involved in these conversations and discussions and policies for 10 of my 30 years with Farm Bureau going forward. And I need to tell you this, what you're learning right now with regard to solar development is going to serve you extremely well in other energy infrastructure. You're having the same discussions, the same debate, the same concerns. It's gotten to be the point I could put all of them on one piece of paper, leave the blank at the top and fill in the technology. The parallels with regard to um, discussion are huge, but I'll leave it at that. Great discussion today, Sarah. Yeah. I have a lot of notes. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad it's going, going good for you. Um, yeah, so taking us back to um, a question Jay kind of follows up with, um, is anyone working on the proposed legislation around, uh, this is uh, House Bill 450, which you may be familiar with if you're paying attention to this stuff. Yes. Um, I can say this too, Sarah. We're paying attention with regard to it. With regard okay. to farm your policies, a number it, of yeah, Dale. How will um, that proposed legislation? What would that mean for Southeast Ohio? Is is kind of the question that, that Jay has. If if you want to throw it on that, Joe, you may also have something on this or Jake. Just yeah, we're well, we're watching that piece of legislation. Um, there is a number of very potential plus points with regard to that, especially for. Um, Rural communities, there's a focus there on Southeastern Ohio. There's also some focus there with regard to urban and suburban communities, brownfield development, all that basically comes into play. But what people are gonna understand is this, you know, Jake is talking about utility scale, which is 50 megawatts and above. And yes, that's 300 acres, but even with regard to community scale, you're talking about 20, the 49.9 and above, and you're still going to be taking 20, 30, 40, up to 100 to 150 acres someplace and doing something with it. Is there a, a amount of brownfield and different things in local communities where that can be done? Yes, but in many communities that want to do this type of community solar, it's not, which means you're going to be taking a look at land use. You're going to be taking a look at spacing 
in many of the discussions Jake has talked about here, you are going to have to be involved in the process, involved in the discussion going forward. Yeah. If you want every the benefit, there's going to be a balance and some sacrifices here. Yep, I agree. Jake, do you want to weigh in? Do you have anything to share? Yeah, I think Dale touched on it with, with House Bill 450 and Community Solar. We're definitely monitoring what's going on, but it does technically fall under our focus of utility scale solar um, and kind of getting back into the delicate balance between viable agricultural land and utility scale solar development. Um, I think it's one of the reasons I wanted to bring up that map of transmission lines going across the state is that there's a very finite amount of land that makes sense for utility scale solar. Um, so it's not something that's gonna take over entire counties or anything like that. It's, it has to be within a couple of miles of those high voltage utility lines. And so there, there is a very finite period and, and time and amount of land that utility scale solar um, could eventually occupy here in the state. Um, and through you know, some of the discussions that we've had on this topic, you can think about it from a different lens where if certain farms for corn are going toward ethanol, you might be taking it technically out of agricultural use, but if that's going toward energy production, it's a different type of energy production. Obviously, that's not the case for every single you know, acre of agricultural land that is impacted, but it is a balance. You know, we, we need more energy, um, and there are only a few ways that we can develop that here locally. Um, and so it's, it's a bit of a, you know, a delicate balance between what type of development are you comfortable with um, and what does your community, your county want? Um, and so I, I know it's been mentioned a couple of times and Joe touched on it. Talk with those developers, have a very candid conversation with them to say, we are comfortable up to this extent, or we are not comfortable with this. It's, there are good and bad actors in every industry um, and obviously good developers get in the community early and often and have those conversations so that everybody feels like they're on the same page and that they have a good knowledge of, of what's going on in their community. Um, you know, if, if it seems like there's a lack of education, push the developer. They should be offering up, you know, opportunity to talk about this and, and all of the information that they have going into the project, um, you know, to a certain extent, they should be willing to share it with community members as well. I completely agree. Great point. Great point. I want to talk about this for another hour and a half. Um, I'm, I'm so glad to do this. Actually, can I ask one last question? This kind of ties everything together. So as we see utility scale solar development and commercial growth in the solar market, and we're implementing this you know, huge influx of cash for rural EV infrastructure, how are we building these things together? How are we overlaying those grids, whether we're talking physical infrastructure, whether we're talking nodes and networks, um, you know, as, as we think about transit, as we think about, um, you know, electrifying our, our, our all, on all uh, scales and classes of vehicles, how is that going to tie in with this grid of the future that we're really building out that will be smart and transactive and uh, meeting the needs across it. Um, does anyone want to just speak to that? Can someone like articulate that vision? Because um, it's, I think, a very high priority, whether in Ohio or elsewhere. Um, anyone? Yeah. Um, Sarah, this is Dan. I'm gonna have to get off here in a few minutes because I'm going on to another meeting here, but I can tell you this, at least in my experience, and I'm getting into more detail and do workshops later, when you're talking about the plan and the outline with regard to the development of the grid, local distribution networks, everything to incorporate what we're talking about here on renewable energy coming into the system, EV infrastructure, all of that. When it comes to energy um, developers, a 30 year time block is immediate. I can tell you this, in the late 1990s, and I wish I still had the notebook, I sat in on meetings where you're working with energy developers and utilities, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, North American Electric, um, um, Electric Reliability Council, where orders and things were done during the Reagan and the first Bush administration to put the plans in place to do what we are doing today. That's how far back they were planning with executing. Need to tell people that this has not been done 
just in the last few years. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Dale. All right. Well, it's 11 o'clock. Um, we're behind by a little bit, but I think we're still mostly on schedule. Thank you again to those of you who were able to present. Um, feel free to stick around. We're about to go into a women in energy panel. Um, and how about, let's see, do we have time for like a five minute break? Yes. Jacob gave us a five minute break. Five minute bio break. See you back here at five after. Thanks guys.
Hi, Sarah. Hi. It's like um, we just decided to do a quick, quick break. So, um, and Jacob informed me we're about 15 minutes off our mark in timing, but that's just, that's how it goes with me generally. I <laughs> keep the, we will be done by noon, I promise. Uh, but we'll we'll just be uh, within. All right. So wrap up, wrap up like ten till. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. So um, Michelle, are you back? Um, if you, uh, Michelle and Esther. Perfect. I'm here. And Carrie, if you could pop your video on too. All right, perfect. I see each one of you and hopefully audio is going good. Um, so far, I think our tech, we've kept our tech running pretty well. So, um, so this is exciting. I, I'm really glad that we can end today's uh, session and the WealthWorks Institute on a note that's very important to me and important to um, sort of, you know, bring, bringing home the work. Um, you know, there are not that many women in energy. There aren't that many um, women leaders in energy. So I just always get excited to meet another uh, awesome lady who's doing this work. And so I thought, you know, let's let's uh, talk not simply about the coolness of being a lady in this work, but also about the work you do. Um, I've invited Sarah Dougherty here um, with Bright Energy Innovators. Um, Sarah is the director of partnerships at Bright Energy, and she manages their day-to-day -day operations, business and program development, marketing and event planning, grant writing, uh, and acts as scrum master to the team. That's an important job too. <laughs> so, um, and I'll leave it to Sarah to introduce our panelists. Thank, thank, uh, thank you. you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the invite. Um, I'm glad to join today. I apologize. I only got to join around like 10 today. So um, I haven't been taking part in all the sessions, but I'm looking forward to being around for the rest of the, the workshops. Um, yeah. So it, as, as far as this topic, I think we all never um, see ourselves as being in energy, right? Um, I think uh, my kindergarten graduation, I was um, scheming between being a, a figure skater or a ventriloquist, right? Um, energy careers weren't necessarily in, in my trajectory, but it just kind of makes sense I ended up here. Um, I was always interested in resource management, and so I did my master's in city planning and spent a lot of time um, in, in GIS systems and, and doing a various um, different um, I'd say marketing assessments for um, energy related items like utilities. And then uh, getting into a career um, in city planning, um, realizing um, I was implementing a lot of grant programs, but I wanted to do more in the policy space and also be closer to the ground. So I had the unique opportunity to join Bright. Um, Bright is a nonprofit. We are um, work through the Ohio Third Frontier Program um, and partner with Tech Growth. Um, to support energy startups and companies with new tech enabled products or services that they would like to launch. It's a fantastic program through philanthropic support. We're able to provide those services complementary um, to startups. And um, with the explosion in uh, innovation, particularly with the costs of renewables um, declining, seeing a lot of interest um, not just from industry and government, but um, people wanting to be involved too. As you can see, I, I have my motion lights here that are too smart. But uh, anyways, regardless, um, thanks again. And then uh, I would just ask, um, I'm just going to go down the line uh, and ask our panelists to introduce themselves and, and tell us how they got involved with energy. So uh, if I will start um, with Carrie. Good morning. I'm Carrie Dunn. I'm with Appalachian Renewable Power Systems. Um, I started in energy kind of in a, a sideways uh, way. Uh, I worked for an engineering company and uh, the owner and founder of that company 
got sent on a, a mission to uh, Liberia and West Africa to install, be the electrical engineer to install a new generator at a hospital. And while he was there, he spoke with the, um, the, the medical director and found out that they had, you know, um, 30 satellite clinics that were in the bush, basically with no electricity and they couldn't afford to give them fuel for their generators. And so we needed to come up with a new way. That was about 15 years ago. And so he came home, we started exploring solar. Um, we did a system on his house, um, kind of learned how it works. Um, the next year we installed a system in in Liberia in West Africa and the following year we installed two systems um, after that I think we did um, maybe three or four we developed a team there to do these installs and um, this past year we just installed systems um, I believe 67 and 68 on various clinics, hospitals, orphanages, and schools. So that's how I came into it. I, I you know, I worked directly with him and, and learned about it. And then a few years ago, um, I came to work um, with Gary Easton at Appalachian Renewable Power. Um, through my work with, with Chip Pickering, um, as we were learning about it and wanted to do more systems, he started offering PPAs to some local nonprofits. So um, I'm part of that company as well, managing those um, installations. So um, I see uh, I see things, you know, on multiple levels as far as installations go. Um, as far as managing PPAs, doing mission work, and then doing residential, agricultural, and, and commercial solar. So it's certainly a fun ride. Um, Carrie, um, so are you, is um, your company still heavily involved in mission work as well? That's correct, yes. So um, when we started working with Gary, that's how I learned about him. And um, shortly after I met him, I, drafted him to go to, to Liberia with us. And so nothing like getting to know somebody by dragging them to a third world country. And uh, we kind of have this joke that, um, you know, we're practically family. When you have to call somebody, when you have to text somebody to bring you toilet paper in a third world country, you're, uh, you're officially family. Okay. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, next up, um, Esther, would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, so my name is Esther Thomas, Esther White Thomas, and I work at David White Services Heating and Cooling, which I co-own with my sister. And HVAC is definitely an industry that um, historically does not have a lot of women. Um, and as far as women-owned HVAC companies, it's very small. We do have some in Athens County that are not just us. <laughs> we have another woman owned business here, this HVAC. Um, but I got into it, my dad was David White um, and I would not probably have chosen energy as my career if I had not been born into it. But some of my earliest memories and those of you that are, you know, older like me you can probably remember the little jingle that AEP had with utility rebates for residential heat pumps all those years ago it, it, it it's um it heats it cools and it saves <laughs> this is when i was very little we installed lots and lots of heat pumps in southeastern ohio in conjunction with AEP to save energy and it was an exciting time um so i grew up really understanding the impact the air conditioning has on our environment. Thank you, Esther. And uh, lastly, Michelle. Hello. Um, well, I'm very new to this. I'm not an owner. Um, I work for John Rinaldi, which owns Green Cab. 
And the biggest thing there was to try to keep the cost down. And that was initiated with when we had the actual, excuse me, the on-demand services as well in Athens. Um, and then they opted, you know, when everything started becoming more and more with the lift and so on. So we started fading out a little bit from that, so from the on-demand to doing the non-emergency medical transport. And we have a flock of 16 currently um, Priuses. So, you know, they're, they're hybrids, they're part electric, part, you know, gas. So it's, it's nice little mixture there. Definitely saves a lot. I drive one for work personally. And every time I have to fill up my Honda, I cry. <laughs> so it's like the Prius versus the Honda is a totally different ball game. Um, thank you. No, thank you, Michelle. And I'd like to ask um, each of you, but starting with you, Michelle, like how has the business changed um, or have you pivoted with the pandemic? I'm sure your model has drastically, you know, with the, transporting people? Um, I mean, one of the biggest things they had, you know, of course, obviously with COVID with the, you know, everybody making sure that everybody's well, um, you know, making sure that we, we are always masked, make sure that we have, you know, the cleaners in the cars, um, that type of thing, make sure that our um, patients, you know, if they are COVID positive, because, you know, we're transporting patients, so we can't say, you know, you're COVID positive, we can't transport you. The whole purpose we're there is for medical transport. Um, so to make sure that that's going to be taken care of, and I realized I'm saying, um, and I'm sorry, I hate that. <laughs> um, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it so evil? I don't get it. Anyways, um, the, the biggest thing is, is just trying to make sure that we don't ever double book anyway. So we're not transporting doubles in a vehicle. So you're not having to deal with the, um, I know like, when you did on demand, sometimes, you know, when you're doing a regular taxi service, you're having multiple peoples in vehicles. We don't do that. We only have the individual client in the vehicle at times. So it's just a safety precaution. Um, there's always, you know, sanitary wipes, the, you know, tons of cleaners and sprays and just making sure that that stays up. And of course, trying to keep drivers has been tough um, with everything going on. And then the stimulus really didn't help us because, you know, the driver pool became less and less. So I was just trying to keep everything up. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Esther, what about your business? Um, so at first, it threw us off a little bit. We were right in the middle of doing our seasonal checkups for people where we make sure their homes are healthy <laughs> by changing their filtration and making sure their heating and cooling system is clean. And we didn't feel comfortable in March of 2020 doing that. No one really knew how to stay safe. So originally COVID impacted us by us just, unless you, unless your heating and cooling wasn't working, obviously that becomes an emergency. We really didn't move forward. But once uh, they were pretty confident that masks and how, they, how it died, <laughs> how COVID could be killed, um, then we went back to doing that and just made sure we had safety precautions and were you know, staying far away from people in their homes. In the long run, it ended up impacting us pretty intensely in a positive way because people are now at home and they're very aware of the air that is around them. And our whole thing is we want to give you perfect, comfortable air that makes you breathe easy. We can clean your air so that you can kill some of those viruses in it. And we also can make your home a, a haven for you, a comfortable haven that's the perfect temperature for you. So the more people who are at home, the more they're like, I'm unwilling to just sit in a stuffy, miserable, horrible place. Um, and so we, we ended up having people be a, more aware of us. Sure. Did you see an increase in demand for filtration systems? Yes. There's been an increase in demand for both the heating and cooling aspects and for filtration. Even, I won't say necessarily people are buying more, but we don't have to work so hard to educate them on how important it is. Because improper filtration actually affects your sleep. If you're exhausted and you're not sleeping well at night, it often can be because you don't have proper filtration and, and correct heating and cooling that makes your house more comfortable. So your whole day can be ruined with the wrong heating and cooling infiltration system because you're not sleeping. And people weren't aware of that. And now they're way more willing. It just, it shortens that conversation 
<laughs> down a lot because they've been educated before we get to their house. Well, that's great to hear. Yeah, I um, I got one of those smart alarm clocks and it always alerts me when the temperature is not quite right. And, um, <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I could definitely see how we've all gotten smarter about those things. And Carrie, tell, tell us about with the pandemic, did you see a shift in your business model? We, we did. Um, we of course had the stoppage of work. We um, could no longer send, you, you know, you're sending somebody not only on top of somebody's home, but also inside their home. And that's, you know, that was really sketchy for some time. Um, but during that time, you know, we were able to, actually, we kept all of our employees. Um, we, through the payroll protection, but also we um, allowed them to take some time to do some, you know, needed to happen. And, you know, everybody got, you know, updated on, you know, the manufacturer training and the OSHA training, OSHA certifications and, and things like that. Um, in the meantime, you know, I was the only one actually, you know, on payroll still, I was still sending out proposals and um, making sales. And as far as sales go, it was like, everyone got the first glimpse of the apocalypse and wanted to talk about solar and backup storage you know um it was it was huge and so we were able to you know book you know at, you know when we started working again um we had a six month backlog which was incredible um and we've just sort of maintained that as long so um people are uh less confident in their you know energy providers now so yeah i, I am a pandemic story my um husband had a little extra time because uh, he volunteers a lot so of course you know board meetings being remote he saved time you know doing the chit chat and so forth so what does he do he spends time uh in reddit learning how to just create his own little microgrid. Um, we don't have much land, so we, we only have a handful of panels on, a, on our porch and a, a marine battery, but uh, it's, it's pretty fun. But yeah, so I, I can imagine if he if he got into it, um, the, the spike in interest in general, it definitely reflects that um, as you um, described. What, what's his name? I want to not that I would reach out to him or anything, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's Jack. 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 <laughs> yeah. No, he's uh, he's mad at me working at an energy incubator where we work with a lot of battery tech startups, and he's mad I haven't provided him with a better battery. Um, I've been going to conferences, um, but it's hard to get a good battery. You know, I, like that. I, at least that's American made. Um, that's, free samples that's, you yeah. know it's not even a thing anymore <laughs> no no not even free samples but um uh yeah just even any sort of um you know domestically uh even if it's just packaged in the u.s is so hard to find too so um anyways but um i'm curious um you carrie let's start with you um you know, have you taken advantage of being a woman uh, registered business? Does that affect your uh, business development process at all or other considerations like with your core values? It does not. Um, I, because I'm not um, owner of ARP Solar, Gary Easton is. And um, our other company that offers EPAs, um, I'm not 51% of, so. We've okay. been unable to take advantage. Okay. And then Esther, you are, have co-ownership with your sister? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are woman owned. We have not taken advantage of any of the grants or anything for that. Um, and as far as it impacting us, I do think it impacts us. We're a lot more in tune with women in the um, industry. And I can't, when the very first conference I ever went to, HVAC conference I went to, was in Indianapolis. And I looked around and I'm like, oh, it is 100% white men and me. 
and my husband who works for me, um, they would all talk to him first. And then he would like step, he's an introvert anyway, and I'm the extrovert. And he would step back and like, look at me. And it was all sorts of awkward. And um, we just last week went to our last con uh, conference that, that's finally in person. I'm super pumped today about, you know, efficient heating cooling <laughs> because of that. But the Lennox Industries, which is the manufacturer of the equipment we sell, at that first conference had six white men on stage as their executive panel. And this time it had three women and a Vietnamese American man. Um, and then and then two white guys. And it just was so, it was such a more approachable panel for so many more people. So I, there's a lot of advantages for women to be in science and math industries that make the whole world better. Because what I always say is I am not selling machines and I'm not selling science because nobody wants to buy that. I'm selling comfort. I'm selling air. I'm selling your family being happier in their home. Anybody wants that. Um, and it, it goes closer to that way, in my opinion, when there are women mixed into that group. Um, because that's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about, okay, here's all the geeky science. We get super excited about that too. But how does it make my life better? How will it make my morning better? And go ahead. I, just, I want to say something. You know, women make the um, decisions in households um, more than fifty percent. So, yeah, very Eight. true. I, I um, I was recently at a energy technology conference with lots of engineers. I was there more for business development. And when I went to the first morning breakfast, I was very excited because there seemed to be like, I don't know, maybe one out of every five people was a female. Then I realized <laughs> that there was a wives club for the event. <laughs> so the women were invited to the breakfast and then and then the <laughs> got worse. So we, we definitely have uh, some some work to do. Um, but with that, um, you know, how how do you stay strong in such male dominated industries? Um, I guess um, Michelle, would you like to share? Again, I'm not the owner, the owner actually is a guy. So. Well, it doesn't matter though still. Um, <laughs> Um, I mean, with a lot of stuff that I do, I've, I've, I was an um, Athens County Veterans Service Officer for 14 years. And as, as that job, I know the Domita, you know, out of the 88 counties, at this point, it's changed a lot. But when I first started, when we would go to the local little district meetings and stuff, I would be like one out of 10. And, you know, I'd be the only female. <laughs> so and it was always like that. You just, I mean, you just have to stay strong and be confident and know what you're doing and go with that. So, I mean, and it's the same with this, with anything. Sure. Yeah, I have to jump in there about the confidence because um, our general manager quit about 10 years ago and I had a three-year-old baby that came to work with me. So I was a mom with a baby on my hip and I was now the general manager of 40 men. Um, and I, <laughs> I, I cannot tell you the amount of confidence I lacked in standing up there telling them that I didn't like the way they had installed the thermostat. Like, here's me with my baby and I don't like the way you did this. It just, it felt weird, all kinds of weird. And it has been a slow process because for me, the confidence has been is my strength actually isn't in the science. My strength isn't in the electrical. I am not in, I am not the person that comes to your house and installs your heating and cooling. I'm not. My strength in is making those people better. And so to have the confidence that I'm not only going to be the person standing in front of you all telling you what you're all going to do, but also I'm, I'm not going to be the expert and I have to be comfortable in not being the most experienced person in the room in what they're all actually doing that day and be confident that what I bring to the table is equally important. 
So that took me, that took me a long time. And one of the pieces happened, we started an apprenticeship because there are not enough heating and cooling technicians at all, which is, I know another question, but um, I started this apprenticeship to help young people come. And so I had a class of four, I think this was like maybe three years ago, four 19 year old young men. And um, one of my, my service manager was helping me. And at the end of the day, when the apprentices had all gone home, he said to me, you know, I think this would be more effective if you teach them to do the tools and I teach them the soft skills. Because if you're standing up there with the drill and you're standing up there with the gauges, they're going to pay a lot better attention because they don't want to be beat by a girl. Um, and so we switched, we switched our roles and it was just my lack of confidence that I didn't want to be the person who actually put the gauges on the line set to show them how to do that because I'm a woman. So fighting my own internal insecurities has been a huge step to all of this. They don't care. They just want to be part of the industry and they want someone knowledgeable to teach them. I'm the one that cared. And so I, I've had to work hard to get rid of that. Thanks for sharing. Um, I know there's been some interest. Um, I know Green Energy Ohio has looked into it a bit and Ohio Environmental Council as well. And having more um, mentorship or um, professional development opportunities for women in energy. Um, do you see a, a need for that? Um, or are there other communities of practice you've been able to find um, to help you grow professionally as well as um, help with that confidence? Um, I see huge need for women to be trained in them. I have been working on it since I started taking ownership of the company and um, I still don't have any female techs. They come and they go. It's very, very hard. There are some now, it's growing, but it is growing super, super small. Um, and the ones that I've hired, I've hired people, women who are 30 and above. The young women who come right out of high school, it's a steep climb to stand in the warehouse with 20 guys and you don't know anything because you haven't been trained and you're you just have a lot of things against you and it makes them all kinds of uncomfortable plus you work in teams of two so your trainer is always going to be a man um so yeah it's it's tricky to get actual technicians in the field i i would all plan maintenance technicians should be women it is such, it is the perfect job for a woman. Everything about it. Plan maintenance, HVAC technicians should all be women. Almost none of them are. And I can't talk women into doing it. <laughs> so yes, it's a huge thing. I've talked about it all over Southeastern Ohio. I go to high schools um, on career day and ask to be in the science room and ask if I can, you know, have mixed company. It is, it is a steep climb. Mm. That's heartbreaking. I wish I had an answer to that. Um, is um, Michelle, are there any like professional networking groups you take advantage of or opportunities for advancing women? Unfortunately, no, not at this time. Um, I was, I've been out of the ball field as far as like actual professionalism um, for some time. I had a, not to dull the moment here, but I had a child pass away a year and a half ago with cancer and she fought for seven years. So I kind of went out of the industry as far as work and just stayed at home and took care of her. Luckily, I was able to do that. And I'm very fortunate. Um, just grateful to be back in the field and working with people again and working with you ladies. It's, it's nice uh, to see Esther with that strong attitude and to try to encourage those young ladies because there's so many young ladies that are so, they, they just feel like they couldn't do that, you know, and we have to realize, I mean, I'm also military veteran so military it was like one to ten as well you know you're always going to be dominated and you just have to fuck up and, and just do it know what know your own self-worth and just go with it thank you and that what about you carrie sorry we're being saved from the mailman here um you can hear my dog in the background apologize no, um so as far as being, you know, a woman in the industry, it was 
you know, it's been, uh, especially coming into ARP where it's all of these, um, you know, it's these themes of men. Um, I came in sort of, you know, the, with the attitude that, you know, I'm not going to do what you have, what you do, and you are very good at it. But I have what I do, and I'm very good at it. And you can't do what you do unless I do what I do. You know, so my job is to make sure that you have the tools that you need and the resources that you need to do your job. And when they understood that, you know, that I was the key to them being able to um, do their job uh, more efficiently and, you know, with less than, and they were prepared and, you know, all of these things. And not just because I signed the paychecks, you know, <laughs> they started respecting, you know, what I do and, and really being open to that. Um, and when they're not, you just don't do it for a couple of days and <laughs> that comes right back around. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but um, I also am actually the current president of our Zonta Club for the Mid Ohio Valley, and Zonta is an international organization like Rotary. Only it's all about empowering women through service and advocacy, and so I'm able to connect with you know a large network of women, and we're actually having our um, district conference this Saturday, and it's all about um, how, uh, you know, environmental changes are affecting all of us. And so it's, you know, it's an opportunity to bring awareness to how things are changing and how it is, you know, affecting women, you know, climate change especially in, in third world countries where the opportunity to grow your food becomes an issue. Um, the, you know, the ability to get water, clean water, you have to go farther to get that, you know? And so um, it's environmental changes really affect women. Important that we, you know, keep that awareness going. So I appreciate all that you ladies do especially that's such a wonderful message um i, I almost want to end there but i i will take us <laughs> a little bit brief time for some questions uh, jay has this great question about um you know having male students in technical schools what can be done to bring women into the technical trade i know esther you talked a bit about that I'd share, um, you know, I'm up in the Youngstown, Warren, the Mahoning Valley area. We were fortunate enough um, through Department of Labor, there was funding to for apprenticeships and we were able to pair that with philanthropy to provide more wraparound services. Um, so basically um, a select group were able to not only take part in the apprenticeship where they were paid, but um, they also received childcare and transportation. And so that did allow for me more so non-traditional or, or women, you know, going through um, various stages of their life when they're, you know, taking care um, could take advantage of that program. But even still, you know, those were just ones and twos. Um, I certainly know enough stories of, um, you know, friends that went into welding because, you know, they were told like plumbers and pipe fitters, this is a growing industry. and they didn't last more than 18 months um, just because of yeah being young in the field was not pleasant but um, any any positive stories or uh, recommendations on how we can improve this um uh, my can, interest sorry. i'm sorry my interest came um very early came in 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 middle school you know and being able to have hands-on experience using tools and being in those, you know, traditionally male, um, you know, classes, you know, like shop and um, just 
having the ability and, and realizing, you know, hey, I'm way better at this than a lot of these guys, you know, um, that gave me confidence to want to, to be in that, in those roles. Um, so anything that you can do to allow um, even girls, high school girls to actually have some hands on in this um, through, you know, project. We used to do partners in education and I would, you know, with like the eighth graders and spend a morning with them doing some kind of building project and put them in groups and, um, you know, let them have that hands on and really see what it's about and understand that they, you know, they like that. They have those skills and it's a great way to provide for their family. So. Yeah, I want to agree with Carrie on starting younger. I think that starting in high school with just me coming in, it's way too late. So I started, um, I, I obviously was born into the industry and then my dad did volunteer projects. So, you know, I can't go to someone's house when I'm five years old and help install their heat pump, but we did volunteer projects. And from a very young age, I think I went to my first one when I was 10 and, you know, you can't do the construction part. You can be near. <laughs> And so you're just around tools and you're around construction. And that's just, those skill sets aren't there for a lot of girls. And it starts really young. If you take a, a girl who's, or a boy for that matter, who's at the height of their insecurity and hand them a tool that they have no idea how to use in a class that's entirely the other gender it's not going to go well for you. But if you take a 10 year old girl like me and you're like, Hey, I'm going to give you a pile of wood and some nails and let you hit these nails into this wood until you've got it. And then you can help me build this wall. I would sit there all day with that hammer and wood until I had that nice smooth motion of hitting it. I'm not going to do that at 14 in a room full of boys. No way. I'm going to sit the hammer down and be like, this isn't for me. So, um, yeah, starting young, if only our young people had access to tools. My girls love power tools. They love them because you're around them when you're little. And then you're like, yeah, I want to be the person who uses the nail gun. I'll be the person who helps do the drywall, you know, etc. I got to wire a circuit board you know, when I was younger and, and make this, this circuit board that lit up light, you know, and it was something, but I got to use, you know, the soldering tool and, you know, follow this, these instructions, make this. And um, it was really empowering. Oh, so, yeah. My That's dad. Great. Um, sorry. My dad was a general contractor and a licensed plumber for the state of Ohio and did a lot of contracting on a lot of different things. And we always joke about that he was teaching me when I didn't realize I was being taught because I was his gopher. Go get this tool, go get that tool, go do this, go do that. And you don't realize you're being taught because you're just watching. But then as you grow, you can do it and you don't even realize you're doing it. And I did it to my daughters as well. You know, because I was self-sufficient. I knew, I mean, unless it's a big project around the house, I didn't want to take it on. I did it myself. And my daughters do the same thing. And my granddaughter's eight years old. And when it comes to even the simplest of things, even if somebody's not handy and doesn't know power tools and doesn't know that kind of stuff, you know, like the little cube shelves you order from, you know, online, let the little ones help put them together because that gives them the idea and the mechanics behind it to do it. And it starts them at a young age and then they want to work with the bigger things. I mean, she's eight, she wants the drill. She's like, Nina, can I have that? I can do that. And I'm like, oh, you might lose the finger. Let's, let's wait a little bit, you know, but she, she's fantastic at it because she's got that attitude of, and the, the ironic thing behind it is both of my daughters married men that are not mechanically inclined and were not subjected to anything like that. And, you know, handing them a drill is like, um, what do I do with this thing? You know, so it's, it's really funny to see how different they are. And like you said, even, you know, a 14 year old boy in high school would be, you know, 
off put by being handed something that he didn't know what to do. And that's my daughter's husband. She, you know, when he, she, he, she handed him something and told him to do something and he looked at her and went, and how am I supposed to do that? She goes, really seriously, I have to teach you how to do that. I mean, it was just the simplest things, but it's, it's not just our girls, it's our boys too. And at a young age, just because you, you know, some people have all the money in the world. My ex-husband, his family had, was very well to do and they, you know, they hired everybody to do anything and he knew how to do nothing. And it's like, teach them the simple little steps it's, you know, we're missing those steps now in life. No matter whether it's female or male, we're missing those steps. Teach them those things, and then they'll grow with them. Well, Carrie, Michelle, and Esther, thank you so much for those comments. You guys have inspired me. Um, I'm gonna go sign up more for uh, volunteering for the summer manufacturing camps now. I know um, Senator Brown had a call for the 2022 season earlier um, this week, so. Um, I definitely, I think that's the way I'm going to contribute going forward from this conversation. Um, with that, uh, Sarah, I'll transfer to you. That was just the most delightful hour. Thank you all. Um, I, I, can't, I really enjoyed that conversation. Um, there was a billion times that I wanted to jump in and keep chatting with you, but, um, but I know I can always see real conversations if I do that, so I won't, but th thank you all for being here. Um, and yes, let's let's carry forward um, all of these great ideas about bringing more women leaders into our into the fold. Um, I guess it, it's time for Leslie and I to kind of wrap things up. Um, it's been a great two days, and just really glad that we've uh, you know had this chance um, for everyone to kind of dive deep and you know, swim into some waters that are probably new and, and different uh, from your day to day. Uh, that's, that was my hope, at least, you know, that we each kind of got exposed to something new and took away from it um, an insight or two that, that you may not have had before you sat down uh, in this virtual Zoom room over the last couple of days whenever you could join. Um, so Leslie, I do want to kind of uh, bring this all back um, under the wealth works framework, um, I feel like our last conversation was really around like cultural impacts and growing rooted wealth in the the social and cultural landscape that we live in. Um, you know, important lasting livelihoods, um, generational livelihoods. You know, families like Esther's that carry on generation upon generation, doing important work that our community really needs. Um, do you see, um, do you want to point to any sort of, you know, um, high real takeaways from, from this uh, last several days um, that, that really stand out to you as far as applying the wealth works principles to clean energy? Well, well I'm still, I'm still so moved by this last <laughs> round of panelists. You know, my dad for 70 years was a union electrician in Cleveland, Ohio. And I think it is back to that individual or intellectual or social context. You know, the, the women that we've just uh, heard from, to a large degree, there was support at some level within their families or peer networks that allowed them um, to not just develop the sort of individual and intellectual capital, but really at some point the, the financial and um, I mean, I, I hear like an undercurrent even of policy there as far as how do we as a network working in the space really look at what our, what our gaps are, but what our priorities are. I mean, I think back to WealthWorks, really analyzing what our current assets are and then designing that sort of next level of interventions, especially after we do a value chain map, I think is really important. So, you know, what just resonated for me is how do we work with maybe some of our educational partners, maybe even some of the other union and coalition partners to figure out um, how to include, uh, again, back to inclusion and local ownership and rural livelihoods, um, more women uh, as leaders uh, in this sector. So I don't know, it's just really sticking for me. 
Um, the other little infomercial, I guess, I would want to um, interject here um, with your permission, Sarah, is a lot of this work is happening throughout Central Appalachia. So to be able to connect everyone who's been involved these last two days in the workshops um, to even a broader network of stakeholders doing this work, I think is important. So if you're not familiar with the Central Appalachian Network, um, both Rural Action and ACENET in Ohio are anchor organizations and a lot of clean energy work. Um, in fact, there's a whole working group that's uh, organized under sort of three different areas within the energy sector. So I would, you know, we're looking for more active members in those working groups. So I would encourage you to, to check out the Central Appalachian Network uh, website. Certainly, uh, I hope people, after watching the video maybe yesterday or listening to Melissa and I present, um, that you use the wealthworks.org website as another entry point. Um, but I'm just, I'm just marveling <laughs> at the assets that are out there right now, and how do we harness, you know. How do we stay more connected and how do we work as a, a larger network, um, whether it's in Ohio or throughout Central Appalachia to continue to move the needle? So I've been inspired. And right. I think looking through the lens of those capitals is a, oftentimes a good starting point. I totally agree. And for those who do wanna learn more about Central Appalachia Network, I dropped the link in the chat. Um, and, and my role there for Rural Action is uh, on our Clean Energy Working Group. And so if anyone is interested in learning more just about uh, how, how CAN operates in the clean energy space, I'm happy to uh, be a resource there. Yes, this, um, Leslie, to your point, we are building networks with each of these conversations. And I realize in, in calls like this, I realize sometimes it is hard to pop up out of the gopher hole. And we are all sort of, you know, meeting our own mission and driving our own work forward. Um, but as essentially as it is, as essential as it is for you to do the work that, you know, is asked of you, it's also as essential to help others do their work and do their work well. So um, that's what the point of network building is, I think, um, for us to each support each other in meeting our missions. Um, and I do really hope that um, there's a, a connection or two made today. Um, again, you know, these are all very helpful, knowledgeable people in the room and who, who we've heard from today. So find them and, you know, work with them as best you can. Um, Leslie, uh, if, um, I guess just to go back real quick to say the WealthWorks, um, website is really useful and the videos are on there too. And I want to, Jacob, would you mind dropping the link to those videos in the chat? I, I just know that they really helped me kind of understand the WealthWorks training a little bit more. So just kind of like circle back to that. Is there anything else, let's say, that you want to circle back to? Um, well, I would really like to figure out with some of the folks what's next, you know, maybe some next steps with some smaller groups would be to do a little bit of uh, network and value chain mapping, um, because it seems like I have heard that there's still certainly a lot of work to be done. And if we do this work together, we know that we can um, accelerate and, and leverage more resources. Um, so if there's ways, particularly, you know, rural action, I would say is the lead in this work. Um, you know, ACENET doesn't have that much of, I would say a footprint within the clean energy space, uh, but we work very closely with entrepreneurs. We have a lot of incubated businesses and other clients who work in this space. So um, however we can be of help, uh, connecting, I think, some of those entrepreneurial services from ACENET and our partners. Um, I would certainly relish any further conversations, either one-on-one -on -one or with some subsets of 
folks who have participated the last two days. And then again, I just want to acknowledge Buckeye Hills Regional Council. We're all here um, because of their support, because of their investment, uh, the fact that they appreciate and validate this framework as a way to really do economic development differently in our communities uh, is incredible political capital. I 100% echo that as well. Um, so for our final act, for those of you still here, um, uh, could we please um, ask that you fill out a little quick exit poll telling us about you know, your experience and what, what your takeaways are. Jacob's on the ball here. Um, take a minute to read through this. We're, we wanna know what sparked for you. Um, was it the value chain, clean energy sector work? I'll let you read. Cool to watch these responses pop right in here. Um, thank you. So Jacob's gonna leave this open, take another minute or two. Also, thank you, Tristan, for putting your contact information in the chat. There's also gonna be, you know, a email follow-up with everybody. But um, thank you again for being here. It was a great, great way to spend the morning. Um, I wish you all well, and we'll be in touch real soon. Um, oh, and everybody thinks the future looks bright. Well, that's so encouraging. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. Good, good, good. Okay. Well, everyone enjoy your afternoon. We'll see y'all soon. Take care. <laughs>